Good morning. This hearing is called to order. This is the public hearing of the City Council Committee on Public Health and Human Services. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on bills number 190715, 190788, and 190804. We have a quorum of members in attendance besides myself, Councilwoman Bass's chair. I want to recognize the presence of a quorum of committee members and members of, in attendance are Councilman Bill Greenlee, Councilwoman Helen Gim, and Councilman Al Toggenberger. We're going to begin with bill number 190788, but before we have the clerk call the first panel or read the title of the resolution, um, we're going to ask Councilman Gim for opening remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, and welcome everybody uh, to this hearing. Today, uh, we're going to hear um, about bill number uh, 190788, a bill that came out of pain and struggle from this past summer. And today is about taking a stand. It's about taking a stand for our city, for public goods, uh, for people, and for health care as a human right. This summer, this past summer, in a city known for world-class medicine, we learned that this system was not vulture-proof. Over the summer, a for-profit hedge fund owner of Hahnemann Hospital rocked this city with the abrupt closure of a vital Philadelphia institution that has stood since the Civil War. The closure announcement was made in mid-June, and Hahnemann Hospital was effectively shuttered by September. So today, a 11 of us are going to have sponsored a bill to make sure that Philadelphia will never again be left out of the critical decisions that impact the lives of our neediest residents. And I want to acknowledge and thank uh, my council sponsor, co-sponsors, uh, Heenan, Greenlee, Parker, Johnson, Blackwell, Squilla, Jones, Dom, Green, and Taubenberger. My, uh, this bill will require hospitals to provide the city with notice of closure six months in advance and work with the city on planning that ensures the appropriate and safe transition for patients and help staff members land on their feet. It's important to know that Philadelphia is the poorest large city in the nation. Hahnemann was a critical safety net hospital which saw 50,000 patients a year going through its ER and we are now down to one to only five maternity wards. Hahnemann had six, there, it was one of only six maternity wards in a city that 20 years ago had 19 places where women could give birth. When that maternity ward shut down with only days notice, 800 moms-to-be had precious little time to find another option. Thousands of other patients had to find, uh, had to find other care. 3,500 employees, some of whom had been with this hospital, for decades, lost their jobs, had their pensions sacrificed, and hundreds of doctors who had trained for years for a placement at a major city hospital scrambled to find other options. It is a telling sign of the downward spiral of healthcare that this hedge fund owner, Joel Friedman, teamed up with a real estate company to buy Hahnemann and then drain it of its assets as it extracted every ounce of profit over 18 months. While we are left to pick up the pieces, Friedman's buying his second house in Los Angeles for $7 million. That says it all. But the harsh realities and the destructive practices of a ruthless for-profit healthcare market means that we in Philadelphia are going to step up. We are not going to allow this to happen again on our watch. And I want to thank um, the incredible work of SEIU Healthcare PA, 1199C, PASNAP, many of the practitioners, the doctors here in this room um, who have crafted a bill that shows us that as a city, we are going to put our people before profits. Today's bill is about supporting all of us, and I look forward to the testimony uh, that will be coming. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. And if we could now have the clerk read the title of the bill. Bill number 190788, an ordinance amending Title VI of the Philadelphia Code, the Health Code, to adding a section establishing requirements for hospitals that anticipate closing all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. And I'm going to call the first panel to testify. That will be Dr. Thomas Farley, Health Commissioner, Department of Public Health, City of Philadelphia. Regina Franklin, member of the National Union of Hospital and Healthcare Employees from 1199C, and Jarrett Smith, representative for government relations with SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania. Oops. 
And uh, in that order, if you could state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Can't hear you. You want to hold it, push it closer? Is it on? Is this working now? Yeah, Got it. that's good. Right. Good morning, Chairperson Bass and members of the Public Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dr. Thomas Farley, Health Commissioner for Philadelphia. Bill number 190788 would require the owners of hospitals to plan to close those hospitals to provide a written closure plan to the Department of Public Health in advance of that closure. We support this bill because hospital closures are potentially risky for hospitals patients, and we believe hospital owners have an obligation to take steps to uh, assure a coordinated transition for those patients. As you know, in early July of this year, Academic Health Systems, the owner of Onaman Hospital, declared bankruptcy and announced its intention to close the hospital. The hospital's emergency department was closed in August, and the last inpatients were discharged in early September. While we believe that there are sufficient inpatient hospital beds in Philadelphia to care for the city's residents who need inpatient care without Hahnemann Hospital, this abrupt and unplanned closure was very disruptive. Hahnemann's owners had made no plans to transfer the care of inpatients or outpatients with ongoing medical conditions, such as pregnancy or cancer, to other facilities. It had no plans for the patients receiving ongoing care in clinics that were closely affiliated with the hospital, and had no plans to secure and store its medical records or to make those records available to physicians accepting former Hahnemann patients. This put the health of those patients at risk and put a strain on the other medical facilities in Philadelphia. This dangerous situation occurred despite the fact that in retrospect, Hahnemann's owners must have known for months before their announcement that they intended to close the hospital. To avoid harm to Hahnemann patients, my department convened a series of meetings during July and August with the medical leadership of other health systems to coordinate the transition of those patients. I want to thank publicly the chief medical officers of every other health system in the city who eagerly stepped up to help, and the many staff at those institutions who moved quickly to accept those patients. We believe those meetings and the actions taken by the participating hospitals were very beneficial and may have prevented very serious harms to many patients. But the process was rushed and not optimal. We could have done a better job protecting patients if we had more time, more notice, and more responsible planning by academic health systems. I want to be clear that my criticism is of Hahnemann's owners, not its medical staff. The medical nursing and local leadership of Hahnemann acted extremely responsibly, working closely with us and the other hospitals to protect their patients and coordinate their care. They did this despite the fact that they knew that they were being laid off in a matter of days. My criticism is solely of Hahnemann's out-of-town owners who left the local staff in a difficult situation. Bill number 190788 would try to prevent situations like this in the future. It would require any hospital owner to file a closure plan with the Department of Public Health 120 days before closing a hospital. That closure plan would have to address many crucial issues important to the smooth transfer of patients to other facilities, including written agreements with other facilities to accept the care of those patients and access to medical records. All hospitals, whether for-profit or non-profit, are community resources funded in large part with public money such as Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. For that reason, I believe all hospital owners, if they can no longer sustain the operation of a facility, have the obligation to close the hospital in a way that is responsible and responsive to community needs. In Pennsylvania, hospitals are licensed by the Commonwealth, not local governments. The Pennsylvania Department of Health licenses, regulates, and inspects hospitals, and it oversees hospital closures. Nonetheless, we learned from Hahnemann that local government and local health care providers have key roles to play in hospital closures, too. I believe Bill number 190788 would be a useful adjunct to the state regulatory oversight of hospital closures and will help protect the health of patients receiving medical care in Philadelphia. I'd like to uh, make one more point before closing. Uh, the current version of the bill, and to my understanding an amendment that may be introduced this morning, includes requirements that the closure plan address issues related to hospital employees, such as assistance in finding employment elsewhere after a hospital closure. While these issues are certainly important, they're not directly related to the patient safety or patient uh, public health. The Department of Public Health does not have the expertise in these issues, and our sole focus is on patient safety and public health. For this reason, the Department of Public Health will not be taking these elements of the closure plan into account in determining whether to approve a hospital closure plan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We're going to hold our questions to the end. Uh, Ms. Regina Franklin. Hi. Good. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Regina Franklin. First, I would like to thank Councilperson Helen Jim for sponsoring this legislation and inviting District 1199C 
to participate in today's hearing. I was a Hahnemann Hospital employee for 28 years as an administrative associate under nursing department. During my 28 years at Hahnemann, we were, multi we were under multiple cells of hospitals. With each cell, we survived. But in January of 2018, American Academic Health System bought Hahnemann Hospital. And on June 26, 2019, all of our dreams, our years, was taken away from over 2,500 workers, with 700 or more being under 1199C Healthcare Workers Union. June 26, 2019 was just an ordinary morning for some, but for Hahnemann, that morning, you just don't know how it changed our lives. Announcing the hospital was closing with two meetings starting at 7 a.m. and the next one to follow. In the smallest lecture room they could find where people were asking, where's Joel Freeman? Why isn't he here? The uncontrollable sobbing that was echoed through out the halls while listening to management tell us there is nothing that they could do. The hospital will be closing. And we knew, looking back now, that they were preparing before the announcement to be in place to close the hospital quick. Because floors were starting to close, we merged together on, one, on two or three floors. Shortage of supplies. There were even no washcloths for us to wash patients. We ended up cutting, we ended up cutting towels so that the nursing department would be able to wash our patients. Vendors weren't being paid, so supplies weren't coming in. Not only was it embarrassing to us not to have cups for our patients to have water in them. It was so unethical. They did not care. They locked floors. They had chains on the doors. How could this even happen at a major hospital in the heart of Philadelphia? How could Joel Friedman come to our city, the city of brotherly love, and disrespect our community the way that he did? How? So I'm asking you to please support this hospital closure legislation bill. In addition to increasing the length of time for closure notice, District 1199C also believes that more needs to be done to protect the collective bargaining rights of our workers at facilities that are scheduled to be closed. Hospitals and healthcare facilities must respect existing contracts and ensure that workers are fairly compensated in the event of a closure, including sick, our vacation time that we left behind, and other benefits earned by employees. District 1199 supports amending the current bill to include this language. For all of these reasons, I strongly urge Philadelphia Council to adopt Council Member Jim's legislation. Thank you for your testimony. Please state your name for the record and begin. Hello, my name is Jarrett Smith. 
And I am the legislative director and a proud member of SCIU Healthcare Pennsylvania, representing 45,000 healthcare workers across the state in hospitals, nursing homes, and home care. And we stand in solidarity with District 1199C and PASNAP. The closure of the Hahnemann Hospital has been a devastating move for our community. Hahnemann served as the main safety net for downtown Philadelphia's neediest residents who viewed the hospital not only as their treatment center, but in many cases as their home. It also provided a livelihood to the 2,572 staff with good union jobs, all of whom abruptly lost their income, their own health care benefits, and many of whom lost their ability to stay in our city. Why was Hahnemann closed? The story we are given is that the hospital was losing money and that we can't expect unsustainable facilities and overbedded markets with poor payer mixes to keep their doors open. But we call BS on that. The people of Philadelphia were sacrificed to the priorities of free market medicine in general, a venture capital medicine in particular, and that is what is unsustainable. In the case of Hahnemann, venture capital medicine brought us Joel Freeman, the California-based owner of the private equity group that bought the hospital for $170 million in 2018 and filed for bankruptcy, saying that he can't be expected to prop up an unsalvageable situation. And now he and his partners own an entire city block's worth of land that was underneath the hospital, as well as the parking garages and a couple of other buildings that Freeman carefully split off from the hospital when he and his co-investors acquired Hahnemann. The same central relocation that made the hospital attractive as a safety net provider now makes the land incredibly desirable for condos or a hotel. Walking away from an ailing business while profiting from the real estate is right out of the private development's playbook. It's the story of Toys R Us and nursing homes throughout our state and across the country in every industry where low margin businesses sit on valuable land. But in the case of healthcare, rich investors are doing more than driving us out of our neighborhoods and taking away our jobs. They're risking our lives. We should not make the mistake of thinking that only for profit medicine is to blame. So called nonprofit health systems are a huge part of our landscape in Pennsylvania, and they aren't much different. They are rapidly consolidating, spinning off for profit subsidiaries closing unprofitable facilities in communities across our state and jacking up costs for us all, guaranteeing that Medicaid patients like those at Hahnemann will always be the money losers. At the same time, they collect millions of our taxpayer dollars through Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements while paying nothing in taxes and pilots and receiving discounts on their city utilities. It has to stop. We spend enough money on healthcare in this country to be able to insure and treat everyone, black, brown, white, rich, and poor. We spend more per capita on healthcare than anyone else on this planet by a factor of two, and we get worse outcomes than anyone in the industrialized world. One of every five dollars in our economy is funneled through healthcare. We don't have a resource problem, we have a priorities problem. For decades, we have been allowing a few very powerful, very rich people, most of them white men, to set the priorities and make our investment decisions. And they have been making very, very bad decisions. They have created instability, like Hahnemann, or the chaos caused by UPMC when it gave pink slips to 182,000 cancer patients and seniors. They have given us skyrocketing costs costs that result in half of all bankruptcies and mean that working people haven't seen a raise in decades. They have opened up a chasm between the health haves and the health have nots. And as the largest employers of non-union low wage workers, they are directly responsible for growing income inequality as well. Working people are tired of shouldering the pain while elected leaders and wealthy CEOs fail year after year to invest in healthcare resources in a way that makes us healthy. Working people, poor people, poor people of color, we were never asked if healthcare and insurance executives should make millions. 
Working people, poor people, and people of color didn't lobby to eliminate the certificate of need, didn't engage in an arms race to gobble up physician practices, didn't cut patients out of insurance networks, didn't jack up pharmaceutical prices, and didn't preside over decades of spiraling costs and increasing disparities, all the while trumpeting their tremendous successes. It is time for us to look around and conclude that turning over our health system to unaccountable private sector actors has been a disaster. In a city where we measure the disparity in life expectancy between black and white, rich and poor, in decades, it is time for the people to come together and demand that a system that is largely funded by our tax dollars and our premium payments be responsive to our needs. We thank Councilwoman Gim for bringing this urgent conversation to our city and stand in full support of this legislation as a first step to controlling bad actors in our healthcare system. Thank you. I want to thank you all for your testimony. It's very powerful, um, particularly Ms. Franklin and your experiences, you know, working directly on the nursing floor and some of the things that you saw that most of us had no idea were happening. Um, you know, we, we knew it was bad but I don't think that anyone knew that it was that bad. And so I really wanna say thank you so much for your dedication um, to the patients of Philadelphia, to the patients that aren't necessarily the quote unquote desirable patients because they don't have private health insurance and they don't have the resources and means, but really making sure that they receive the quality and a level of health care that any and all of us should receive regardless of your economic situation. So I just really wanted to say thank you for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, and again, it's really just shameful in terms of the way healthcare in Philadelphia is playing out. Um, you know, we see the, or we call ourselves a city of eds and meds, and yet we have so many who are so far disconnected from the healthcare system that we have here in the city of Philadelphia. The disconnect is real, and you see it in the results, short of life expectancies, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, um, all kinds of ailments that come by way of being, um, you know, uh, living in poverty, living in particular neighborhoods and particular zip codes. We see it over and over again. And yet, uh, while the healthcare community in Philadelphia overall has done some great things, they're really kind of missing um, the big picture, which is all of us, all of us who make up Philadelphia and who desperately need to have them connected with all neighborhoods, regardless of your abilities. So um, I just really wanted to say that and to say thank you so much for all that you all have done and fighting for us. Thank you to all three of you. Um, with that being said, Councilwoman Kim. Um, yes, just a brief comment. Um, I also want to thank the panel. Um, we're glad to have the full support of the administration behind this bill. Um, we know that Pennsylvania has some fairly, needs a lot more to do when it comes to hospital closings. New Jersey, for example, has a much stronger state legislature when it's taking a look at hospital closings. And right now, there are dozens of hospitals that are in worse financial shape across the state of Pennsylvania than Hahnemann was this past summer. So this is a very serious issue for our state legislature. We appreciate uh, your union's advocacy, not only here in the city of Philadelphia, but also at the state level where we need to see stronger protections in place. Um, but I also, I wanna especially thank um, Mr. Smith and Ms. Franklin, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, again, you know, your passion, compassion for uh, your patients, um, for the level of care that you gave up until the very last day, the very last minute, um, is demonstrable about why this matters. Um, and we want you to know that we're gonna stand with you uh, with your union and with your non-union brothers and sisters here. Um, you know, it is also really important to keep in mind that uh, your jobs are also a health issue. I assume that when these jobs were lost suddenly, that people were left without any indication, was there a break in health insurance and benefits and all of that as well, in terms? Yes. Um, with 1199C, um, it was based on um, whether you were still getting um, your unemployment and the years worked. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a tear. So a lot of us, yes, we still kept our um, insurance. Um, and they had multiple job um, uh, fairs 
for us outside of what City of Philadelphia gave us. Um, they still, I mean, even as of last month in October, they had another job fair, and they probably will still be running more and more as time go on. Um, you know, it's 700 or more of us, so um, we haven't hit that high number yet as far as people landing jobs, but there is moving up, yeah. which is a blessing. Um, but you actually didn't have advance notice. Like this bill no would have given advance. you six months advance notice of any kind of pending uh, closure if that's in the works and that would have given yes, you more planning will. time. So. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it seems like the ball was, as soon as the meetings were over, we felt as though the ball was rolling. It was just rolling so fast. Um, the phone call over the phone letting the nursing department know you do not have to return to work. So 28 years and that was it, over the phone. You don't have to return to work. And that was two weeks in after the announcement. Mm -hmm. So yes, this bill would give us more time and um, you know, more time to do what needs to happen and to get prepared for yeah. out there in the world because you have to understand a lot, of time, a lot of us hadn't interviewed or anything for over a certain amount of years. So thank you very much for bringing that forward and making it clear, like for us, you know, poverty and unemployment is also a health crisis. Um, it's a health crisis when people lose their incomes, when they, when they have to be forced onto a job market unexpectedly. So I appreciate your testimony deeply and your passion for your patients. Um, and thank you for being here to testify today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Toggenberger and then Councilwoman Brown. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And thank, I thank the panel deeply here and bring this uh, to light. And Ms. Franklin, I thank you, and also your union. Philadelphia is a better place because of 1199 Yes, it is. I'm very aware of your, your good work, and uh, I think it's very important. You would mention in your testimony, if this bill were in place at that time, you would have had more time. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, we would have more time. Do you think this bill is strong enough? Yes, I do. Um, the reason is, is because um, 60 days is just not enough. 90 days is not even enough. This bill gives us, give us another like 180 days. That will be enough time to um, reevaluate where patients are going to go. Um, what hospitals are they going to go? They'll be able to get records. There are still patients out there that don't even have their records yet. Um, from the hospital closing. Um, and also, um, it will give the workers time to do what needs to happen as far as um, unemployment, um, going back to school, um, whatever it takes for us to land a job. So 180 days, 160 to 180 days would be great. The, the other, uh, I was going to say, in many ways, you, you, your union, 1199C, was not only an advocate for workers and its members, but also for patients, very much so. Is that correct? I mean, you were yes. really yes. concerned very deeply about patients, sometimes something that is missing in today's uh, medical industry. And it is an industry of sorts, and, and is many times not looked at if patients are that important. But I commend you and 1199C for looking out for the patient's welfare and their well-being beyond yes. this, this circumstance. Did you have any inkling at all that this might happen? Were there rumors uh, in the hospital? You know, there were rumors. Um, it was rumors throughout. Um, it was rumors with other cells. Um, sure. But you just never would have thought that um, it would actually close. I mean, even till the end, there still was hope. Sure. that um, the hospital would stay open because we had just, I mean, we've um, graduate, you know, those hospitals had closed, but it's just Hahnemann closing, like it just was unbelievable to think that that hospital would close. Um, with all the updates that 1199C was coming in and letting us know what was going on, if it wasn't for them, we, I really think that we would have been shut down long before the time really? that we, we did because the ball was just rolling so quick. Um, well, and thank God that we were able to still, because of them, get our pay. That, that speaks to the, uh, 
the well-being and the strength of, of, of your union yes. in, in fighting for not only, once again, workers, but also for the health of, of, of the patients. Yes. So I, I, I thank you for that. I do have one uh, last question. You had mentioned there are a number of job fairs that are continuing. Who is the prime sponsor there? Um, District 1199C okay. had a job fair um, last month. Um, um, Jefferson came and a couple of other places came um, just for people to go back and um, try to apply for whatever other positions that were out there. Do you need volunteers at that job fair? Um, there were, um, it happened at our school, which is called the Breslin Center. Okay. So they held everything there at on, on Broad Street. Well, I would be happy to volunteer my time if oh, you want to take you. my name and number. I, <laughs> I commend you. you for what you're doing, your leadership of your union and the strength of it and helping make Philadelphia a better place. And once this bill was introduced, I turned to Councilwoman Gim who was that hard to turn to her because she sits next to me and said, I would like to co-sponsor because I, something like that, I think, is terrible for the workers, terrible for the city, and I stand with those who try to rectify that and make that better. So I thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman uh, Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, too, want to, to go on record first to, to say thank you for your very compelling, uh, honest um, testimony and to think that uh, we had to hear your stories to come to grips with the, what I believe to be egregious actions by well-compensated healthcare administrators. So kudos uh, to the sponsor of the bill, Councilwoman Gim, and all, of, all members of city council, some present, some not present, who paid close attention to this debacle, I would call it. Uh, secondly, I too had heard whispers from uh, girlfriends, quite frankly, who were in this healthcare space and was dumbfounded to learn of the uh, surprise that the uh, employees had to suffer from. Hats off to the partnership that you uh, formed with 1199C. We know that uh, but for Henry Nicholas and Chris Woods and others over there at the Hospital Workers Union, uh, this would not have not elevated to the space where it could be and should be. Lastly, I'm pleased to hear that you are okay with the extension, 160 to 180 days, because it takes anybody, small and or large institutions, to figure out how you do things in their proper order. Mm -hmm. So uh, your testimony uh, punctuates why this bill is necessary and that should not go unrecognized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, no additional comments. Thank you very much to the panel for attending today. We really appreciate your support uh, for our health care system here in the city of Philadelphia. And we're going to call, I'm going to call the next panel up, Dr. Kevin D, Dr. Kevin DeMello, forgive me for mispronouncing, mispronouncing the name, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Division of General Internal Medicine at Drexel University. Mary Carmen Farmer, MSN, midwife and women's health nurse practitioner with Drexel University. Okay, thank you for coming. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning. My name is Dr. Kevin DeMello and I'm a physician who serves as the Director of Quality Improvement and Patient Safety for the Department of Medicine at Drexel University College of Medicine. Completing, completing my residency training there and continuing on as a academic hospitalist. I practiced at Hahnemann University Hospital for a total of nine years before it closed. I appreciate you allowing me the time to appear before you to testify in support of bill number 190788. In the United States, we currently have a healthcare system that views the endurance of hospitals as the survival of the fittest. But there are tremendous problems with how we define fit. The fittest institutions receive the highest reimbursement rates for care from private insurance companies. To achieve that, those institutions must have a greater hold on the local market, typically accomplished by buying up other hospitals to create large health systems. This gives them a better ability to negotiate for higher payments from those insurance companies. Considering the costs involved in this strategy, these institutions must have significant capital to achieve those higher reimbursement rates. Thus, the well-funded are rewarded with additional funds. And all of this is dis despite the fact that the medical literature demonstrates that these fit hospitals are not necessarily providing better care to patients. 
On the other hand, the unfit institutions in our current healthcare system tend to be located in rural areas or care for predominantly poor patients. Many of these patients are either uninsured or are covered by Medicaid because private insurance is either not willing to cover them or is just too expensive for them to afford. Because Medicaid and charity care reimbursements to hospitals is comparatively low, uh, in order to survive, these institutions need to somehow offset this financial burden, quote unquote, of treating the, the poor with uh, caring for patients with private insurance. If they fail to do so or do not get substantial funding from the government, these hospitals will close. Our country has already seen a significant number of these hospital closures over the past several decades. Our country essentially has a healthcare system with a mix of private, public, for-profit and non-profit organizations that inadvertently divides our people into the haves and the have-nots. The care of the have-nots is generally not seen as profitable or even sustainable. This is the setting in which Hahnemann University Hospital closed. The 171-year-old institution was a place of innovation in Philadelphia's historical healthcare landscape, being the site of the city's first level one trauma center, dialysis unit, kidney transplant, and bone marrow transplant. However, financial troubles have plagued the institution for the past several decades. In the 1990s, it was one of 14 hospitals bought up by Allegheny Health Education and Research Foundation in its aggressive strategy to build a large health system, a strategy that led to it filing for bankruptcy within just a few years of those acquisitions, becoming America's largest nonprofit healthcare bankruptcy at the time. From there, Tenet Healthcare owned and operated the hospital as it continued to have significant negative operating margins over the next 20 years. Over this time, Hahnemann became increasingly a safety net hospital, serving mostly patients with Medicare, Medicaid, and charity care. In this setting, Philadelphia Academic Health System, an affiliate of the private equity firm Paladin Healthcare Capital, in partnership with Chicago-based healthcare real estate private equity firm Harrison Street Real Estate Capital, stepped in to purchase the hospital. Inherent in the concept of a private equity firm is the need to turn a profit. Considering that Hahnemann is zoned to CMX5, the most permissive tier of mixed-use zoning, and, the hospital, uh, and that the hospital lost money for 14 years straight under tenant, there were significant suspicions that uh, Philadelphia Academic was merely interested in the real estate, not in providing health care for the people of Philadelphia. Ultimately, Hahnemann closed. The most troubling issue with the closure was the method in which it was closed. While the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has a law requiring 90 days notice of a hospital closure, Philadelphia Academic closed the hospital in less than half of that time. Even when Dr. Rachel Levine, the state's secretary of health, wrote a letter to Mr. Joel Friedman, owner of Philadelphia Academic, asking for a cease and desist of the hospital closure until a closure plan could be approved by city and state officials, he moved ahead with shutting down vital hospital services, such as trauma and cardiothoracic surgery. Consequently, within seven days, the hospital census dropped by 50% and continued to drop until it reached zero in just several weeks. The effects of Hahnemann's rapid closure have yet to be rigorously evaluated. I worry about the health of our city's people. I worry about having one last level one trauma center in the city. I worry about other hospitals being overwhelmed despite what hospital CEOs may report in the media. I worry about the 570 graduate medical trainees whose careers might be adversely affected by the unexpected change in educational programs. <clears throat> I worry about the trainees who incurred unexpected costs in having to relocate. I worry about the trainees having to pay for a prohibitively expensive malpractice insurance covering their time at Hahnemann because Philadelphia Academic refuses to pay for it despite their contractual obligations. I worry about students of health profession schools who have lost a major clinical training site. I worry about the 2,500 city jobs. That are gone and likely will not reappear, all reappear at other health institutions in the city. I worry about what the Hahnemann closure and its consequences tell us about the future of American health care. I, like most healthcare workers, love my job because I help people. I help people on the deepest level. It's what drives me on a daily basis. And I believe this drive is at the very basis of human society. Sorry. It is the drive inherent in medicine and healthcare, and we are incredibly lucky 
that the city of brotherly love is full of people dedicated to it. These people, these healthcare workers, need the support of the city, the state, and the country. Decisions on increasing or decreasing Philadelphia's healthcare resources need to be a collaboration between those, those that have financial and organizational interests, i.e. the private or public institutions, and those that protect the health of the people, i.e. the community and the government. I do not know whether Hahnemann could have been saved, but I do know that the healthcare of any city cannot afford the risk created by a venture capitalist flouting attempts at governmental protection of the public good provided by healthcare. I fully support bill number 190788, and I believe that it, that it will give the city's government greater strength in its ability to protect its people from the consequences of another quick hospital closure, whether at the whims of a self-interested venture capitalist or not. Ultimately, I hope that our country can move toward a healthcare system that strives to be the tide that raises the boats of all people. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, and we can tell, obviously, that it was very heartfelt, and, um, you know, th thank you for being here, for um, really speaking um, truth to this, this situation and what has happened here in the city of Philadelphia and all of our concerns. I know we normally save comments to the end, but I really just wanted to thank you because I can, you know, obviously we can see your passion and your concern and your care you know, for the city and for what we do. And I think that we've all been uh, pretty much up here on this panel, we've all been where you are in terms of really um, feeling frustrated that the city can do so much more. We all believe that it can be so much more and so much better. And um, so I, I, I see that and I hear that in the words that you spoke. So thank you so much. I appreciate thank that, you. thank you. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Farmer. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, my name is Mari Carmen Farmer and I am a certified nurse midwife. I've lived in West Philly for 25 years, have been a birth worker in the city for the last 18 years and have been a practicing nurse midwife in Philly for the last three years. I'm also the current president of the Philly Metro Midwives, which is the local chapter of the PA affiliate of the American College of Nurse Midwives. Thanks for the opportunity to testify this morning. I worked as a midwife in Philly's largest hospital-based midwifery practice at Hahnemann University Hospital from June 2017 until L&D closed its doors on July 12th, just 16 days after the announcement of closure. At the heart of our practice is the care we provide to pregnant folks at five of Philly's eight health centers, where our patients are primarily Medicaid insured or uninsured. I'm, I'm sorry, can you pause for a moment? We need, we need quiet. Uh, in the room, please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As midwives, we have been educated to provide reproductive health care throughout the life cycle, including but not limited to the care of childbearing people throughout the course of their pregnancies, birth, and the postpartum period. We provide support, offer therapeutic presence, and create an environment where evidence-based clinical decisions are made with the input of the patient and their expressed values. At Hahnemann, we were lucky enough to practice in a collaborative model of care with our physician colleagues that maximized the strength of the midwifery model of care at a hospital that served as a safety net for many of Philly's poor and working class people. The diverse staff, nurses, midwives, physicians, residents, and medical students who work there understood the impact of social justice on medicine and health. They understood that our actions as clinicians have the potential to harm or heal far beyond just the physical aspects of health, and that health encompasses wellness in mind, body, spirit, family, and community. This model created an environment at Hahnemann that yielded low C-section rates, high rates of VBACs, which are vaginal births after cesarean, an obstetric unit that served as a safe and welcoming transfer site for folks in the home birth community in Philly, and as a collaborating hospital for a planned future federally qualified um, health center, birth center in Philly, as well as a place where cultural humility and a solid understanding of the relationship between racism, social and structural determinants of health, and good outcomes for patients deeply impacted clinical practice. We know that when a hospital like Hahnemann closes, the remaining obstetric units go into survival mode, where space to care for laboring patients is extremely limited staff to patient ratios and wait times increase, and the likelihood that mistakes and oversights occur goes up. 
Under this kinds of, kind of stress, clinicians find that they must compromise practices that comprise the very best care, practices that ensure that patients are treated with their full humanity in mind, and practices that help eliminate bias and address more subtle forms of mistreatment. Families with limited financial means are left no choice but to go to hospitals that may not have support services established to provide optimal individualized care that they deserve. Our practice has been fortunate to partner with Thomas Jefferson University Hospital to continue to provide prenatal care at all of the health centers. But despite our best efforts, the strain on our patients to navigate a new and complicated health system is significant. It took, it took time for Hahnemann to build a trusting relationship with the communities it served and to understand their needs, and it will take time to rebuild at another institution. We know that one of the recommendations found in the literature about how to mitigate the adverse effects of a hospital closure is to increase formal communications between hospitals in the region. Although serious attempts were made to do this when Hahnemann was closing, the short time from announcement to closure simply didn't allow for effective implementation. Had this bill been in place, the approach could have strengthened the city's response. If only we could have ensured that every affected patient would have had the time to make a plan with their provider, would have had a good chance of preserving continuity of care, could have gained access to their medical records in short order, and could have had the opportunity to figure out how to navigate the uncertainty and anxiety of the closure to help ensure the best outcome for, this, for their family. The bill could have made a significant difference in both the quality of the experience for patients and providers, as well, in the, as, well as in the quantitative effects of the closure. I would like to end by recounting some of my personal experiences in sharing in the grief of patients who continue to mourn the loss of their home hospital. The day that the closure was announced, I found out from the news. I cried with my patient June, who was 32 weeks pregnant, preparing to give birth to her fourth and last child, who looked up at me with tears in her eyes and said, do you know that four generations of women in my family have given birth to their babies at Hahnemann? Do you mean to tell me that I'm about to give birth to my last kid and I won't be going to Hahnemann this time? Do you have any idea what this means? And just this past Thursday, my young patient Brielle came into the hospital for a scheduled induction of labor at 41 weeks. For weeks, she's been expressing to me her trepidation about going to Jefferson, expressing how hard it, has it is to come to trust a new institution after years of going to Hahnemann. When one considers the extensive history of mistreatment, abuse, and victimization of black and brown people in the US at the hands of the medical system, it is easy to see how this closing fits into the same troubling narrative for those communities in Philly. In trying to allay her fears, I struck a deal with Brielle. She would come to give birth at Jefferson if I promised to show up dressed in my Hahnemann jacket to help her feel more at ease. I did just that, much to the amusement of my Jefferson colleagues, and thankfully she went on to have an uncomplicated birth a few short hours later. If only the solutions to this larger, much more complicated problem could be all that simple. I'm grateful for your efforts on our behalf and on behalf of our patients this summer, and I thank you for allowing me to speak out in support of this important legislation. Thank you very much for your testimony as well. Councilman Gip, woman Gip? Yes, um, I want to thank Dr. DeMello and Ms. Farmer for your incredibly powerful testimony. Um, I think that so often the hospital closings and things like this are spoken about in terms of whether, you know, an economy can absorb something. It's like debt leverage. It goes into the language of, you know, courts and terminology that means nothing, creditors, et cetera. But, you know, you speak to a lot of what uh, it means that healthcare is the very meaning of whether life continues, um, how it continues, and what quality of care that people have assurances that it continues. And so we can't speak that language anymore. Um, and Dr. DeMello, I think you more than, you know, at, during the fiasco, that when it was all going on, you put to words the importance of us not being so confident about what we think we know. The, we can absorb these patients. They can go elsewhere here and there. But in fact, what we don't know is the most worrisome part of all the things that you brought up. Who don't we know? A man was shot multiple times in Center City 
and walked to what he thought would be an ER at Hahnemann Hospital, only to find that it was closed a few weeks ago. What we don't know are the patients, um, Ms. Farmer, that you serve, who are approaching care, especially when they don't have insurance, especially when you walk into some of the fanciest, loveliest places and aren't sure if you're going to be treated equally. I mean, I think that those questions about what we don't know is what we were so callous about. We were disregarding it. We were assuming that we have enough hospitals, we can absorb them, there's too many ERs, there's too much like patient whatever ratios, da 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 da. And we didn't, we are not taking into account people who have traditionally been shut out of the system. We live in a city where there's a 20 year life expectancy difference between zip codes, less than a half a mile apart. And in those instances, we actually have to do a lot. And I just, I just want to, I have a question for uh, Ms. Farmer, but um, Dr. DeMello, I just wanted to like read the quote that you wrote about um, during, over the summer. And I think you wrote, whatever happens to the hospital, let that city block forever be the living mirror that reminds us that we will never fail ourselves again in this way. And that the health of this city full of our brothers and sisters is more important than money. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and Ms. Farmer, you know, one of the things that I think you brought out in your testimony really well is that our hospitals um, need help in dealing with many of our of the patients that formerly had went to Hahnemann, mm -hmm. felt at home there, were assured that they could get quality care there, uh, would feel equal there. But do you feel like some of our hospitals uh, currently need some trainings to ensure the continuity of care? Uh, for the patients who formerly went to Hahnemann, especially those without insurance, especially those who feel a lot more financially insecure? I do. I think that um, one of the things that um, Hahnemann did really well was take care of poor people, and they knew um, the health center system, and they knew how to integrate those patients seamlessly from outpatient to inpatient care. Um, and I think that... Um, that is a set of skills that needs to be, that, that is not universal and is often overlooked because it's not really, it's just like, let's just do the clinical work, but there's a lot of other barriers to care. And um, we who work in the health centers, we really see what those barriers are and hit up against them all the time. Yeah. And when a system, you know, it took years to get Hahnemann to the point where the system was seamless, but it, it was almost seamless. And now being in a new system that's trying hard, but um, we run up against those barriers all the time. So I think um, that training would be great, and I think just a continued em emphasis on how to integrate the care of people with lesser financial means into the mainstream, uh, like you said, the fancy, lovely hospitals, um, that, that would be um, excellent. Because I think um, it's, not, it's not just about the clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot more about the quality of the experience mm -hmm. that gets lost in the stories. Um, and we can really see that going from one institution mm -hmm. to another. Exactly. Um, and it's not that people aren't trying. It's, it's really a systemic issue. Um, so, I don't know. You know, our, the midwives, our emphasis was not to lose those patients. That was our whole focus. Like, we were going to go to the place that was going to allow us to keep caring for those health center families. Those you know, those are the people we care about. That's why we do the work we do. Um, but, it, but it hasn't been easy. The transition has been um, full of obstacles, so. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. The chairwoman had a fantastic hearing on maternal uh, health yeah. and mm -hmm. mortality mm -hmm. issues. And if only medicine were about science, we'd be in a lot maybe sure footing. But we know mm -hmm. that healthcare has a small part to do with science and a lot to do with how we treat people, how mm -hmm. people feel welcome, accessible to their care, whether they are heard um, and whether their needs are, are met. And that has a lot more to do than a bunch of machines and an mm -hmm. insurance broker um, behind a phone. So I want to thank you for doing that. And Dr. DeMell, I didn't know if you wanted to like have any like final words or anything. I thought you spoke beautifully, but just really wanted to thank you again for your leadership on this. Um. You know, I, I think my, my support for this bill, um, I, think, I think giving the city the, the ability to have that power to kind of um, uh, make sure, you know, uh, to be able to take care of its own healthcare resources, right? Whereas I think prior to this bill, we're, we're left with the state having to regulate it. And, you know, in this situation, right, Mr. Friedman did what he wanted. 
and and you, you know I think our, our it, it felt like our hands were tied. Yeah. Um, yep. So fully support this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for being here. And um, for our last panel, we have Dr. David Eisenberg, Drexel University College of Medicine. And if there is anyone else here to testify on bill number 190788, please come forward now. Okay. All right. Dr. Eisenberg, please state your name. Eisenberg, I'm sorry. Please state your name for it's the record. Eisenberg. Thank you very much, Eisenberg. David Eisenberg. Um, I'm an associate professor of medicine at Drexel University of College of Medicine. Thank you for the opportunity uh, mm -hmm. to express my support for this bill. Um, I am the former internal medicine uh, uh, residency program director, mm -hmm. and I apologize that I don't have any um, written prepared remarks because the issue that I'm going to be talking about is relatively rapidly developing, or at least we're mm -hmm. becoming aware of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was the program director at Hahnemann University Hospital for one of the many specialties that actually trains residents and fellows when they finish medical school. Many of them finish medical school, actually the average debt is $200,000 after, after completing their medical school. And many of them came to Hahnemann Hospital to care along with all of the team members that we heard from today for the sickest and poorest patients in the city. Um, and that is something that they have had a lifetime commitment to. And I worry about a couple of things that we've actually discovered recently. Um, the issue is the malpractice insurance that the owners of Hahnemann have actually decided not to pay going forward. And it looks like that this decision was actually made back in um, 2018 when they purchased the hospital. Um, despite being contractually obligated to purchase a specific type of malpractice insurance that would follow employees of the hospital f going forward, the ownership decided to purchase a malpractice insurance that would end on January 10th, 2020. So after that date, um, many of, all of the employees of the hospital will actually not have malpractice insurance for care that patients would have received during the entire time that AAHS owned the hospital. Um, this, as I said, is a violation of the contracts that our residents and fellows signed. Um, and I think that this highlights a couple of things. Number one, this is exposing two very, more than two, but I want to focus on two very vulnerable groups. The first and foremost are the patients who received care during this time. Now we know that medicine is not always perfect and things happen and patients are, have the right and they should actually be able to bring malpractice lawsuits and actually be compensated for anything that may have happened that was not right during their hospitalization or with offices affiliated with Hahnemann. And the, these patients will have a less of a chance to be adequately compensated because our trainees won't have the tail malpractice insurance unless they purchase it themselves. And so that, I think, is a huge deal for patients who are already underserved and would require that compensation to actually receive future care that they need, either at, either at rehab facilities or home care or anything like that. And so that's the first vulnerable population that I think is, is significant to point out. The second one are our trainees. And so this doesn't just affect the 570 that were orphaned. It's the largest orphaning or um, it's the largest closure of a academic training hospital in the history of our country. But this also affects anyone who graduated prior to that who actually provided care during the time of AHS's ownership. So it's just around a thousand trainees that are affected by this. And you can imagine all of the patients that they took care of for the 20 months of AHS's ownership. Um, as I said, these trainees are already in debt. They will be opened up to significant liability. Um, many states actually have requirements to have uninterrupted malpractice insurance to actually become licensed to practice medicine. Um, and many jobs actually require proof of continuous malpractice insurance in order to get credentialed at hospitals and, and practices. And so this is a significant issue. I also think that 
this will actually make it less likely for these 980 trainees who committed to coming to an underserved and caring for an underserved population to do this in the future. And I personally feel that this could be a potential brain drain from our city. Um, and then finally, the cost of this tale is prohibitive for many of our trainees. Already in debt, the range is wide depending on specialty and depending on amount of time that they cared for patients in the hospital, but it could be as much as 70, that's $70,000, which many of them, if I don't think any of them would be able to afford at this time. And so I think that looking to the future to give more time and possibly even highlighting this specific issue in the bill is very critical, but I also ask the council to consider if there's absolutely anything we can do to help this situation of lack of tail malpractice insurance for the people who are currently affected, and those are the trainees who have already been displaced to other health systems, and also the patients who receive their care at Hahnemann Hospital. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, th thank you very much for your testimony. I think you brought a lot of things to light that uh, someone like myself who's not a physician and not really connected in that way to the medical community wouldn't have no idea uh, in terms of the interruptions, uh, you know, with, with malpractice insurance and just all of the other things that really uh, go into uh, what this disruption to healthcare in Philadelphia will mean uh, beyond just, you know, sort of like the, the obvious disruption, which is uh, poor patient care and, and displacement. So, um, you know, I thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your testimony. And seeing that there's no one else here to testify on Bill Number 190788, if we could have the clerk now read the title of Bill Number 190715. Good morning again. Good morning. Please state your name for the record All again right. and begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson Bass and members of the Public Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dr. Thomas Farley, Health Commissioner for Philadelphia. Bill number 190715 would require pharmacies in Philadelphia to submit data to the Department of Public Health about the prescribing and dispensing of controlled substances. We support this bill because having this data would help the department respond to the opioid crisis and prevent future problems caused by the inappropriate prescribing of dangerous drugs. As you know, Philadelphia has been hit particularly hard by the national crisis of opioid use, addiction, and overdose. Approximately 1,200 people have died of drug overdoses in each of the last two years, giving Philadelphia the highest overdose mortality rate of any, by far of any large city in the nation. While use of heroin and fentanyl is contributing to this crisis, the overprescribing of pharmaceutical opioids like Oxycontin and Vicodin and Percocet also continues to be a major cause. In a survey conducted by our department in 2017, 13% of adults in Philadelphia, which amounts to some 168,000 people, reported taking prescription opioids. If even only a fraction of those people become addicted to these drugs, it still represents a huge number of addicted people at high risk for overdose. Although we should all be concerned about the diversion of opioids from the legal to the illegal market, the primary source of, for pharmaceutical opioids in the city today is the legal prescription from a licensed healthcare provider. My department has taken many steps to persuade healthcare providers to reduce inappropriate opioid prescribing, including mailing guidelines to 16,000 physicians in the metropolitan area, sending staff into the offices of 1,300 medical practices to deliver very direct messages. Still, we need to do more to reduce inappropriate opioid prescribing. Based on de-identified prescri prescription data that my department has analyzed, the prescribing of opioids in Philadelphia is extremely skewed. 1% of prescribers write nearly 30% of the prescriptions. The next 10% of prescribers write nearly 45% of prescriptions. And more than half of prescribers write virtually no opioid prescriptions at all. Therefore, our outreach and education to prescribers should be targeted rather than one size fits all. Bill number 190715 would require pharmacies to submit in Philadelphia to submit to the department on a quarterly basis information about the prescribing of controlled substances. This would include information about the healthcare provider who wrote the prescription, including his or her name and specialty. The data received as a result of bill number 190715 would allow the department to target our education to high volume prescribers to persuade them to write fewer prescriptions. 
to shape those educational messages according to the medical specialties and prescribing practices of these high volume prescribers to create prescriber dashboards that summarize the prescribing history, including a comparison to the average prescriber of the same specialty, to evaluate the effects of these steps by measuring changes in provider prescribing patterns, and working in coordination with law enforcement agencies on the small number of irresponsible pill mill prescribers who do not respond to education. It is also important to note what this bill does not do. The bill does not require the reporting of any information that identifies patients. The bill will not place an additional burden on pharmacies. The data to be shared as a result of this bill are identical to the data already being sent daily from pharmacies to the Pennsylvania Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, also known as the PDMP. All that would be required would be for the pharmacy to establish a separate, secure data feed to my department, which is accustomed to receiving and analyzing large amounts of data. You may question the need for a local reporting requirement given the existence of the state's PDMP. However, the state's interpretation of the state law that established the PDMP is that while the state health department has full access to the PDMP data, local health departments do not. We have asked legislators in Harrisburg to pass legislation allowing local health departments access to the PDMP data, but we do not expect legislation on this to pass anytime soon. Given the magnitude of this crisis, we do, do not believe we should wait any longer to get relief from the state on this issue. Bill number 190715 would allow us to obtain the data soon to take appropriate preventive steps that I just described. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions from the panel? No? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. You could probably stay right there. Is there anyone else here to testify on bill number 190715? No? Okay. If we could have the clerk now read the title of uh, bill number 190804 and also while he's preparing to do that I also want to recognize that we have written testimony on bill number 190788 which was the first bill heard by public citizens the women's medical fund health professionals and allied employees and Kathy Dakoski former Hahnemann hospital patient thank you and Dr. And Dr. PJ Brennan, Dr. PJ Brennan the Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Thank you. Bill okay. number 190804, an ordinance amending Chapter 9-600 of the Philadelphia Code Entitling Service and Other Businesses to add on new Section 9-638 entitled Sales of Electronic Smoking Devices mm -hmm. and Youth Accessible Establishments, mm -hmm. prohibiting selling and offering for sale certain electronic smoking devices and youth accessible establishments and fixing penalties all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. And we have Dr. Farley here, uh, Commissioner of Public Health and Human Services. Before you begin your testimony, Councilman Bill Greenlee would like to make comments. Councilman? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I don't think you have to be a news junkie to know that youth vaping is a health ep epidemic, and the majority of the kids that, that get addicted use flavored e-cigarettes. Uh, this bill, I think, addresses the only real uh, way to address it, which is to keep kids away from this dangerous product and not have the product where the kids are. Um, I, I think we'll hear uh, from a, a, a representative of the Youth Advocacy Institute uh, uh, advocating for this bill, but I wonder if, uh, I know a number of them are here, only one's going to testify, so mm -hmm. we're not going to have a law, but I wonder if they could all stand, the ones that are here from the Youth Advocacy uh, Institute, who are here in support of this bill. And doc, thank you, thank you all. And Dr. Farley will give the, uh, all the reasons why this is a good bill, but I want to just address one other thing before he speaks. I, I know, and look, I'm always looking for a compromise. Uh, I would argue this bill's already a compromise. We're not banning this product. We are regulating it, and we are regulating it where the high, uh, nicotine, uh, the high nicotine and the flavored product can be sold and kept away from young people, because that's the, the issue we're trying to deal with here. Uh, we're not telling stores they can't sell certain products, but uh, I think when you balance out what is the most important thing is maybe a little, uh, being the stores be, being able to make a little bit more money and kids' health, I don't think that's a quick, I don't think that's a tough decision to make. Mm -hmm. So I hope we join other cities and states 
who have uh, put in these re uh, reasonable regulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Brown? Yes, good morning, good morning. Good morning. I want to echo uh, the sponsor of the bill's bottom line, which is that we have to be smarter in how we find reasonable solutions to keeping uh, anything that's going to be harmful and challenge the life and life chances of young people, uh, bringing it to members of city council in a way that we can deal with it. So first, a thank you to Councilman Greeling for this vital legislation that continues the trajectory of this council doing all we can to protect the lives and life chances of Philadelphia's children. This legislation serves as another preventive measure uh, to regulate and to deter our children from the negative health implications of, spoke, of smoking. Uh, during my tenure as a member of this council, I've made it clear and my mission in a number of ways to serve as an advocate for women, families, and of course our city's most vulnerable, our children. Also, given that, as is the practice in my office, we do not operate in a vacuum or with a myopic vision. We seek to leave no stone unturned and explore every avenue when it comes to introducing meaningful, reasonable legislation that is equitable across all sectors. With that said, the record should reflect that I've had my staff pull what other countries are doing and what other cities might be doing. And the most uh, recent information I have that I want to put on the record, which uh, moves, moves me, quite frankly, is that the um, official policy of the United Kingdom and its Royal College of Physicians is actually to promote e-cigarettes among adults for people trying to quit. The Royal College of Physicians explicitly tell doctors to promote e-cigarettes as widely as possible to people trying to quit, not to children, but to adults who are trying to quit. Because vaping carries a small fraction of the risk of smoking. So I think it's important as we proceed with this conversation, discussion, and friendly debate that we focus on what we want to do in the best, in best interest of children, and we try to do all we can to help adults who want to stop smoking. And where always possible, we try to keep family whole with small businesses that are trying to feed their families. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Madam Chairwoman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman. All right. Okay, and with that being said, uh, uh, Commissioner Farley, if you could be then begin your testimony, please state your name for the record. Good morning, Chairperson Bass and members of the Public Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dr. Thomas Farley, Health Commissioner for the City of Philadelphia. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony on Bill number 190804, which if enacted would re restrict the sale of flavored and high nicotine salt vaping devices to adults only establishments. We strongly support this bill. National use of e-cigarettes and other vape products by teenagers is at epidemic levels and continuing to rise. Use among every age group of young people from middle school through 12th grade more than doubled between 2017 and 2019. The change from 2017 to 2018 alone was the largest increase of any substance use among the nation's youth ever recorded. Today, more than a quarter of, and I gotta correct my written testimony here, it's more than a quarter of high school students, not just 12th graders, but all high school students are using e-cigarettes, more than one quarter. This increase is due in large part to two factors. The addition to vaping products of uh, solutions of fruit, candy, mint, and menthol, menthol flavorings that appeal to kids, and the introduction of nicotine salt products. We know that flavored e-cigarettes, which smell and taste like candy or desserts, motivate children to start vaping. 97% of current e-cigarette users use flavored e-cigarettes, and 70% cite flavors as a key reason for their e-cigarette use. I've got a couple of examples here I thought I might just show you. This is a product that we bought here in stores in Philadelphia. This one is pink lemonade flavor. This one here, these are pods that are compatible with Juul uh, that are in strawberry milk flavor, strawberry milk. Uh, this is uh, pods that are mixed berry. And this one is called, I lost it, it's called peachy mango, excuse me, peachy mango. This, this by the way, advertises, uh, which one? 6% nicotine. And I'll get to the nicotine levels in a bit. Sure. One flavor, menthol, is one of the most popular flavors by e-cigarette used by teens. We know that teens who smart, start smoking with menthol products are twice as likely to become regular smokers. And we know that teens who start with e-cigarettes are more likely to later use combustible cigarettes. 
Restricting the sales of flavored products would be a major step forward in reducing the number of children who become addicted to nicotine. We also know that e-cigarettes like Juul that use nicotine salts to deliver high levels of nicotine in users are especially risky. Nicotine is a drug that is as addictive as heroin. Older e-cigarette devices generally use nicotine in freebase form. These devices contained less than 20 milligrams of nicotine per milliliter of fluid. But Juul and new Juul lookalike devices typically contain much higher levels of nicotine. Each 5% Juul pod contain, contains nearly as much nicotine as two packs of cigarettes. This is possible because nicotine salts lessen the harshness of high nicotine levels, making the use more palatable. E-cigarettes that use nicotine salts typically have extremely high nicotine concentrations. In some cases, three or more times as high as the older freebase products. And nicotine salts can be more rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream than freebase nicotine, increasing the potential for addiction. The European Union, that includes the United Kingdom so far, banned e-cigarettes containing more than 20 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine, allowing e-cigarette access for current smokers while protecting teens from the higher addiction risk of the newer high nicotine products. So just to be clear uh, in, in reference to the comment that Councilwoman Reynolds Brown said, all those products that I put in front of you are banned in the United Kingdom, are banned in all of the uh, European Union because they have these extremely high levels of nicotine. Uh, Juul has complied with this rule by marketing in Europe a product with less than 20 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine, about a third of the nicotine levels of Juul sold in the United States. The manufacturers adopted to the regulations put in place there. This epidemic of youth vaping set the stage for a second epidemic, e-cigarette or vaping-related lung injury. As of November 5, 2019, over 2,000 cases and dozens of deaths have been reported, including multiple cases in Pennsylvania and one death in Pennsylvania. Approximately 80% of patients were under 35 years, a, uh, years old. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's current belief is that most of these cases have been caused by users vaping liquids containing THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, and vitamin E acetate. But the agency's investigation is ongoing, and much of this epidemic is not yet understood. There's no question that the widespread availability and use of e-cigarette devices by teens and young adults has enabled this epidemic to occur. The FDA has had the authority to regulate vaping devices meaningfully since 2009, and it has announced plans to regulate them multiple times, but each time it has failed to act. Most recently, the president announced it, uh, it said that he was not going to be acting on e-cigarettes, although they had promised to do that very recently. As a result, no one knows what ingredients are in e-cigarettes because the FDA has not required manufacturers to disclose this information. If no one knows what's in them, certainly no one can truthfully say that any of these products are safe, especially if they are used daily for many years. As more and more young people become dependent on these highly addictive devices, states and cities across the country are stepping up to protect their young people. Some are banning flavorings. Some are banning e-cigarette sales entirely. I should point out that yesterday the American Medical Association voted to recommend a ban of e-cigarettes entirely. This bill takes a more balanced approach. It would restrict the sale of e-cigarettes that contain flavorings or high nicotine levels in salt forms to stores that do not allow children to enter. Juul and other similar products will continue to be available in qualifying adult-only stores. Lower nicotine tobacco-flavored e-cigarettes will remain broadly available in stores that have tobacco sales permits. And I have here a list of uh, e-cigarette products that stores that have regular tobacco sales permits would be able to sell under this bill. So there are many products that these stores could continue to sell under this bill. You may hear opposition to this bill from the owners of convenience stores who would like to continue to sell flavored and high nicotine salt e-cigarettes. They may claim that they have a record of never selling tobacco to youth or that they have their own robust youth tobacco compliance programs. But data from the city's youth compliance program shows that convenience stores very frequently sell tobacco products to children, even though this is against the law. For example, 34% of youth compliance checks done at 7-Elevens in Philadelphia over a three-year period resulted in an illegal sale of tobacco to a minor. This is the same high rate of non-compliance for all tobacco outlets citywide. This means that if we want to prevent our children from purchasing the most unsafe e-cigarette products, we need further restrictions on the stores that can sell them. Overall, we believe this bill would help protect Philadelphia's children from e-cigarette marketing, 
reduce the number of teens who become addicted to e-cigarettes and help limit the adverse health effects of vaping, while still allowing adult smokers who want to use e-cigarettes to quit smoking to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, thank you Commissioner, um, and thank you for providing the list of items that are still available for sale um, in, in, these, uh, in the stores that are currently selling all of these products. And so there are, um, you know, quite as it looks to me like there's quite a selection of flavored products that would still be um, eligible for sale under this bill. They're not flavored products, although their tobacco flavored is allowed, but no other flavors are allowed, but they are certainly e-cigarette products right. that could be sold and that um, adult smokers who want to quit could use. Okay, all right. And I thank you for also providing um, these uh, samples, uh, pink lemonade stick, which is um, interesting, and also strawberry milk, that sounds delicious, <laughs> and mix, mixed berries, and... Um, peachy mango. Peachy mango. That sounds very tempting. Um, so thank you for provide, providing those as well. So, Councilman Greenlee. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I just... Some of my questions just you touched on, but I just want to kind of bring out. But first of all, as the chairwoman said, are, is there any doubt that peachy mango is directed towards children? No. I mean, this is okay. a sort of, a, it's a candy so, flavor. It's the sort of thing that children You think a 40-year-old guy trying to quit cigarettes is not going to be tempted by peachy mango? Uh, I, <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Okay. All right. I don't know. Maybe somebody would, but, you know, I wouldn't think so. So, um, so as you pointed out in your testimony, 97% of uh, children, uh, young people, um, use flavored cigarettes, right? Correct. Flavored e-cigarettes, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, um, so they're clearly geared towards uh, young people, right? I mean, is there any are, doubt right. about that? No, any no doubt, doubt in my mind. Okay, all right. And, and even, you know, Jewel has acknowledged that and is claiming that they will not be marketing the flavored e-cigarettes in the future. Uh, but let me point out that those products there are uh, not Juul, okay? Now, there are now an entire category of what I would call Juul knockoffs uh, mm -hmm. that make these flavored products. Right. So there's still widespread availability of these flavored products in convenience stores and bodegas across the city. And, and just for the record, just as you mentioned Juul and maybe some of the other companies, aren't they, uh, aren't at least part of their ownership some of the big tobacco companies? Yes, uh, Altria, the uh, corporate um, behind, corporation behind, um, I believe, Philip Morris, uh, has purchased something like 40 to 50 percent of the stock in Juul, and they have installed a uh, uh, chief executive officer who is a former tobacco executive. So basically, mm -hmm. Juul is now part of the regular tobacco industry. And, and just again for the record, I think we all know this, but uh, these big tobacco companies um, have a history of not exactly telling the truth, right? Uh, yes, they said that, that, that smoking was not addictive. Right. Uh, they said that they don't market to children. Um, and they're and, not a cancer risk? Didn't they say that? Uh, they may have said that in the past. I that think they've said that in the past, too. You know? So I guess, what, what's the old thing? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. How much are we going to be fooled by what these people say? Certainly, you know, Jewel has said for years that we don't market to children. Nonetheless, we've seen this huge run up to now 25% of teenagers are using these products. I might also point out those 25% of teenagers are not smokers trying to quit. These right. are kids who'd never smoked. Uh, they took up what is now essentially a new drug delivery device, a new drug, uh, because it's unregulated and the industry can market it uh, mm -hmm. without restrictions. Mm -hmm. And as you say, oftentimes that leads to smoking uh, regular cigarettes, correct? We know that teenagers who start using electronic cigarettes uh, with nicotine are more likely to later use combustible cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And I just, you said it, but I just want to be clear that this bill does not stop um, the 7-Elevens of the world, if you will, from selling the uh, products like you, you gave out, right? The, the, Correct. The lower nicotine tobacco flavored products, tobacco flavored. Right. And I would think a lot of the adults that are actually trying to get away from um, uh, smoking regular cigarettes are much more likely to go to tobacco flavored um, you um E-cigs? You would think so. I mean, the, the candy is a way to attract children. Adults have less of a, a preference right. for sweet flavors right. like that. Right, right, right. right. And again, they, they, people can still keep selling these. So, I mean, sure. you could argue that the FDA should ban flavored products and should ban products with nicotine levels above the threshold, as right. they did in the European Union. Right. Uh, this doesn't ban those. It allows them, but it allows right. them only specialized places where we know kids are not going to be. And then the products that we hope, although are not proven, are safer 
would be still widely available in any place that has a permit to sell tobacco products. Okay. And that's why I, I say you know, open in that this is a compromise bill. This is just not. I believe this, uh, you know, achieves the correct balance. I should say that there's a fair amount of uncertainty around e-cigarettes. No one knows how safe they are over the long term. There may be some value to current smokers who want to quit, uh, but we definitely don't want teenagers who've never smoked to use these products. So we think that this strikes that, uh, that right balance. And, and just, I mean, we've, again, seen in the news how many young people have gotten seriously ill or even died from, and I know some of these are things that they, what you call, uh, kind of break down and use other products in them, but I mean, that's, this isn't just kids could be getting hooked on cigarettes. Kids are, kids could be dying from this stuff, right? Right, so, so um, kids can buy products that, you know, over the internet that was made in somebody's basement uh, that may be sold has got THC and who knows what else they threw in there, in this case maybe vitamin E acetate, and sometimes it could be one use that ends up being fatal. Uh, we were once told well, that Juul is actually hard to break into and to change out the liquids, uh, but we put that to a test and our tobacco staffer was able to break into a Juul pot in about 30 seconds with a paper clip. So they can uh, easily be transformed in other uh, ways. So, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, it's very easy for these products. Once children start using them, it's very easy for them to switch to other products that are even uh, less regulated and more mm -hmm. dangerous. Okay. And just a couple of things on, on what we might hear from other witnesses. Um, I know the issue of menthol comes up, and it comes up a lot when we talk about cigarettes, you know, regular cigarettes too. What is your feeling? I mean, some people might advocate taking menthol out of the regulated, uh, taking out of this bill. What, what would be your opinion on that? So, you know, the, amongst the uh, f favorite flavors among teenagers, uh, menthol is number two. Is menthol. Uh, and, uh, and I don't particularly see why adults uh, need menthol any more right. than tobacco flavor, what they're used to. Uh, smoking is probably more tobacco flavor than anything else, so I don't see any particular value to adults trying to quit. Um, I should also point out there are many proven uh, medicines to help adult smokers quit. Proven to be safe and effective, licensed by the FDA for this purpose. Uh, our first recommendation to any smoker who wanted to quit is to first try those medications. You know, if they can't, then e-cigarettes are available. They are unproven. The companies who made e-cigarettes have never done the studies to demonstrate their effectiveness. They've never done the studies to demonstrate their safetyness. They've never d disclosed their ingredients. So it's out there, uh, but I am reluctant to encourage uh, adult smokers to use this product in, in view of all that uncertainty. Because mm -hmm. there really is less knowledge about what's in these than regular cigarettes, I guess, right? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Regular cigarettes, we know what's in there. Uh, those have right. been regulated. We, there's, you know, probably um, e-cigarettes are safer than regular cigarettes on a puff-for-puff -puff basis. However, uh, we certainly don't want people who are not using regular cigarettes to take up e-cigarettes. No one knows what happens to your lungs if you use uh, e-cigarettes for decades. They haven't been around that long. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, their lungs are different from your skin. These are delicate tissues uh, that even uh, chemicals that may, we may feel are safe uh, could really damage over a period of years. And, and when you say the FDA, I mean, I know they're it's supposed to be independent, but they've always been kind of influenced by the, the people in charge in the... 1600, right? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, and, and the FDA um, announced very recently that they were going to take action. And right. uh, my okay. understanding was that they were going to ban all flavors or almost all flavors, uh, right. and they were ready to do it in a matter of days. Uh, then President Trump said a few days ago that no, he was going to reconsider that. And uh, the FDA, unfortunately, is brought under too much political pressure from the industry these days. Right. Right. We, and, and and certainly, this is. It would be our preference for the FDA to be acting sure. on regulating these products. But. It, uh, editorial comment. You don't have to respond to this, but if uh, the, the man that's temporarily uh, residing in the White House, if, if he has influence on something, I don't trust a darn thing, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, just real quick, two, two other things that might come up, I think, after you will come up. The issue of the age, making it 21, what's your feeling about that? We support raising the age of the sale of all tobacco products from 18 to 21. Okay. There is a bill in uh, the legislature in Harrisburg that has made a lot of progress. I, I forget exactly where it is in this but, uh, stage, but I think it's likely to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, and we certainly think when that, that would be a step forward. Uh, however, um, as I uh, pointed out, there's, it's very common for stores now to sell to children who are underage, who are under age 18. Uh, yeah. Raising that to 21 isn't going to change much if they continue to defy what the law says. Right, right, right. right. Um, and lastly, uh, scanners. Um, you commented on it in your, your testimony. I understand we might hear something about these new uh, just uh, uh, 
put together scanners that are supposed to be um, more foolproof, but scanners have not really done the job in, in a lot of these stores, even the 7-Elevens of the world, correct? Yes, yeah, so, you know, the, the uh, convenience store industry uh, continue to say, we don't sell to children, we never do, uh, and so you don't need to worry about us. Um, and then some stores claim they have claimed in the past that they have a scanner system where they scan the, uh, the customer's ID card to see what age they are, and that mm -hmm. uh, assures them that they will not sell to youth. Uh, but I can tell you that we certainly have clear examples of where our teenage testers have gone in, and there's a scanner there, uh, and they're able to buy tobacco products, either because they don't right. ask for the teen's ID, uh, or they ask for it, they scan it, and they still sell the product. Uh, now, I understand from a conversation uh, just before the hearing began right. that uh, the industry is claiming that there is a, some sort of new technology that would right. not permit the clerk to do that. Uh, I am very reluctant to um, make a decision based upon a technology that is new and unproven, uh, right. especially when, again, we've had multiple assurances over the years that they never sell to children, and our data show that they continue to sell to children. They do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. And thank you for all the, the work you thank do you, for the health of citizens of Philadelphia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question on the, yeah. the scanners. Um, because I agree that, you know, like there always has been this conversation about, um, uh, uh, you know, retailers saying, oh, we don't sell to anyone under 18, anyone under 21. You have to show identification. Right. You have to do, you know, this and the other thing. And we know for a fact that that doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, one of my staffers, we were at an event uh, at a, a store in Nice Town, and they were sold, um, you know, a, a, pro, a, a cigarette, you know, a Lucy, right, uh, right, right in front of us, um, if, to someone who was clearly underage. But so we know that it happens. But my question is uh, regarding the scanners. Do you know are the scanners mandatory? So for all retailers of tobacco products, do they all have no. scanners? So it would just be some who have scanners, not everyone. Correct. Right. There's no okay, mandate so for this. Okay, so it's not across the board. So we don't. Correct. So if, if we um, relied on the scanners, we'd only be relying really on a small portion or a portion. I don't know if it's small or not, but a portion of Correct. the retailers Correct. who would uh, be selling these products. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilwoman Gim and then Brown, and then Toggenberger. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, so in your testimony, you're, you're, uh, I'm a mom, I'm here as obviously a city council member. I'm very concerned about how this impacts the whole city of Philadelphia. But I'm also a mom of a high schooler. And uh, I know anecdotally, actually maybe not even that much anecdotally, but uh, a lot of what you're putting into statistics. For my daughter, um, the use of jewels and e-products and all of that is rampant. It's all throughout the school, at her school. Um, they do a lot to evade the scanners. Um, a lot of my concern is that they've been pitched this as if it's safer somehow because it's not cigarettes. Um, and to me, one of the biggest concerns is that this industry is manipulating perceptions and marketing in the same way that they do with sugar, in the same way that they do with uh, soda and other kinds of products, um, and that young people aren't, taking, aren't making that distinction. They're not hearing that it's for adults. They're hearing that it's safer than cigarettes. And then they're seeing the packaging. Um, and I guess, you know, if we, if we don't want our kids to smoke, then we don't put these products in which kids are. It seems pretty basic. And if, you know, there's an adult location, and if this is geared, what is the age limit for purchase of cigarettes? 18. 18. Mm -hmm. So if you want those folks who are on cigarettes to quit smoking, then put them in an adult shop where they're up over 18 anyway. Um, and they can buy their peachy mangoes and their frothy lemonades and their candy cane stripes or whatever flavored kind of products that they want. But um, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, I mean, what is the city doing in terms of looking at the impact of the expansion of nicotine marketing, particularly to young people in any format? I'm not distinguishing whether it's a cigarette or jewel or whatever it is, but that, um, or vaping products that, but the, Nicotine marketing feels like it has gone off the rails again in a way that we were able to control it, moderate it, manage it, regulate it. Um, it's gone off the rails. And I know that my daughter, her friends, my college-age uh, children right now, 
um, are certainly getting that message that it's being marketed towards them. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. There, there is a widespread perception among teenagers that these products are not just safer, but that they are safe, period. There's yeah. nothing wrong with them. Um, that doesn't come from nowhere, it comes from somewhere. Uh, and certainly, uh, there's a lot of marketing that takes place over social media in particular, because that's where you reach teens. Uh, Juul has marketed in social media in the past, and they're now claiming they're not going to do that anymore. But you know, there's now many other companies that are producing the same products. Uh, we unfortunately don't have the ability to regulate that marketing. However, we can try to counteract that marketing. So while we are supporting this bill, we also are currently uh, running a campaign on social media called Behind the Haze, uh, which is targeted specifically at teenagers and lets them know about the risks uh, and the unknown risks of e-cigarettes and points out that really this is just coming from an industry that wants to get them addicted to nicotine. Uh, that campaign may still be overwhelmed by the marketing of the industry, but that's, we're doing what we can. I should also point out that there's marketing um, at point of sale, which is also part of our, uh, one of the benefits of this bill. If you go to uh, uh, convenience stores or uh, probably bodegas as well, you're gonna see uh, ads for Juul, uh, often at eye level for a 12 year old. Uh, and so and a store is effectively a billboard that's supporting e-cigarettes. Um, and, uh, and so we have a long way to go to address the me uh, messaging as well. I should say I, I had a meeting with the Centers for Disease Control people who were in charge of the investigation for, over the uh, lung injury. And uh, he said, as far as e-cigarettes, he th said, the marketing is what brings the horse to water, the flavoring is what gets them to drink, and the nicotine is what keeps them drinking. So these are three elements that really are driving the e-cigarette problem. And would you say, I mean, based on past practices with this industry, that they overwhelmingly will target black neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods higher than they do in other neighborhoods? I think the industry is looking for profit, and they'll go wherever they can. Um, their initial work was over the internet, and then it was more at high-income neighborhoods, but it's moving into lower-income neighborhoods now. And certainly in the end, the neighborhoods and the communities where there's less oversight, where there's less government presence, or where they can make the greatest headway. We certainly know for um, combustible tobacco products that it's much more common among low-income folks and minority folks. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And as I said, my, my feeling is, you know, I have a grave concern about how these products are being marketed and pitched. Jewel had to be pushed off of Instagram. We've got a cowardly president who had to cave to an industry, can't even make regulations around this. And so in the absence of responsible oversight and regulation, it's up to cities and localities to do what they should. And I think the biggest concern that I have, especially in the presence of so many young people who I really appreciate like coming out here, and um, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing if there's testimony, um, but we'll, we're listening to you. Um, and if you're telling us some things that we need to be aware of, um, your experience, your lives are about policy, that there's a market that's being built off of your lives, um, that your health and your money um, and your neighborhoods are in play. And what I wanna make sure is that we don't allow that to happen without your presence. So I really, just really wanna thank the young people who came out here today um, with organizations and groups and advocates as well, but um, especially because if we don't hear from, from folks, uh, we're gonna make policy um, absent your voices and that's never gonna be a good thing. So, um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Councilwoman Brown. Yeah, good morning. I want to echo Councilwoman Gim's uh, salute to the young people here who sh who've shown up to register your, your voice, your presence around policies that ultimately impact you. Uh, let me say for the record that Councilman Al Taltenberger, Councilwoman Gim, Councilman sponsor of this bill, Greenlee, chair of this committee, and myself all agree 2,000% that products like this are unacceptable for children, period. So there's no dispute about the principle of the bill. Let me repeat that. There's no dispute about the fact that these products are unacceptable, and we as policymakers have to be prudent, smart, responsible, and reasonable when it comes to making sure we're protecting children. That needs to be stated for the record. So with that said, please speak again to uh, menthol and how that has gray lines when it comes to protecting children and having it available for adults who are trying to quit smoking. So surveys of teenagers who are using e-cigarettes when they're listed, as what, what flavors do you use? The number one flavor are fruit flavors, like those. Number two are, are menthol. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so these are a very common driver for children to start using e-cigarettes. What the, what the menthol does is it has a numbing effect on the mouth and the throat, and so you're less likely to uh, feel the, the uh, liquid in there as being harsh uh, when I you see. take it in. So you um, are more likely to use a product at all and are more likely to use a product that has high nicotine levels, which can be harsh in its own right. Okay. Uh, and so, um, you know, there may be adults who use this, but I think on balance, uh, there's no reason to make exception of that flavor over any other flavor. Okay. Um, in certain municipalities, I know for sure in Delaware, to follow up on Councilman Greenlee's question, uh, with regards to raising the age to 21, as a, a measure by which we further protect children who are smart enough or strategic enough to, to approach others to, to represent them with the uh, purchase of certain types of products. What, what is your view again with regards to raising the age to 21? Yeah, so we are strong supporters of raising the sales uh, age for tobacco products and, and e-cigarettes are classified in law as tobacco products, raising it from 18 to 21. The, uh, the reason we did not bring this idea in front of the city council in the past is that the city is preempted from taking that action. I Only see. the state of Pennsylvania can do that. Uh, but there are um, anti-tobacco advocates who have brought a bill uh, in Harrisburg on that. Uh, it's been, they've been working on it for years. Uh, it is very close to passing in Harrisburg. Okay. And then lastly, the, um, uh, in, in response to Councilwoman Bass's question, scanners are not required in, in these stores? Speak to that again. Scanners are not required uh, to be a, a tobacco um, permittee. So, you know, some... Um, uh, some of the convenience store chains have voluntarily uh, started using scanners, um, which on the surface sounds like not a bad thing. But again, our experience is that convenience store chains here are selling tobacco products to children just as much as independent bodegas are. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thankful that I, I never picked up a cigarette. Uh, are, you, are you a smoker? I am not. Have you ever been a smoker? If you count a few cigarettes I had when I was in fourth grade. <laughs> but beyond that, no. Okay. <laughs> What, what did you grade. say? Fourth grade. That's right. They start children young. Started young. You're a bad boy. <laughs> you turned out all right. And so, and so for the, my, my, the story I like to tell is I, I was the oldest of seven. My mother told me if I picked up a cigarette, and she would do something that was probably not lawful because I had six other siblings <laughs> behind me. All of my siblings smoked at one point. I never picked up a cigarette. So trying to lead by example didn't matter in that particular circumstance. So for those who fall upon the, the, the crutch, some might argue, I would not because you know, folks figure out ways to handle their own stress. Um, for those who fall in that space where they have to rely on e-cigarettes um, and, and given your, you, you respect uh, data and research as do I, when I look to hear and read that um, the Royal College of Physicians promote e-cigarettes as widely as possible to, to people trying to smoke, by banning stores from selling e-cigarettes, we simply encourage the use of more dangerous alternative for adults. Speak to that if you would. Yeah, so the United Kingdom has approached this uh, very differently. They have very much regulated the product okay. to make sure the product is safer. As I said, you can't sell e-cigarettes with more than 20 milligrams per milliliter. That's about a third of the nicotine levels of Juul. Um, I don't know what their regulations are with regards to flavors, uh, and I, uh, I'm not sure what their actions are about youth access. But I do know that this epidemic of uh, the vape lung that's happened in the past few months did not happen in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have a much safer regulatory environment, uh, then there might be uh, some logic in promoting some of these products for smokers. I can tell you around the world that there are, there's a diversity of opinion among public health people about this. Uh, and I can tell you that there are many other, that, that the value of e-cigarettes to help smokers quit is unproven. And we have many uh, other forms of treatment that are proven to be safe and effective. And so stop right there. For, for, for those who fall upon a space, because that was a part of your earlier testimony, fall in a space where they're trying to get off drugs or stop drinking, it's easy for us to say what they can do and should do. But for those persons who are in the struggle themselves, they ultimately have to decide what works best for them. So I reject the notion that we can, we can, we can uh, prescribe what we think is good for somebody. That's easy for us if we're not walking in their shoes. For those shoes we're not walking in, I'm of the view as a policymaker that we need to at least be compassionate and sensitive to their circumstance so that we can try to make their life chances and their circumstances better. 
Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. We, we, we love smokers, we want to help them quit. Uh, there are many options available to them. There are nicotine patches and gums, there are medications. And I should also point, the same type of e-cigarettes that is available to them in the United Kingdom would be available in convenience stores and bodegas across Philadelphia under this bill. This bill would not prohibit the lower nicotine level e-cigarettes from being available in Philadelphia. Okay, please say that again because that's really important. Right. So that this bill would not uh, restrict uh, in any way the lower nicotine unflavored e-cigarettes uh, from being sold in um, convenience stores and uh, bodegas across Philadelphia. Any, any place that has a a permit to sell tobacco products could sell those, what we believe to be the safer uh, versions of e-cigarettes. Okay then, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Toggenberger, and then we've been joined by Councilman uh, Curtis Jones Jr. who would like to make comments after that. Thank, thank you, you so much. Madam, Madam Chair, thank you very much. And Dr. Farley, uh, well, fourth grade, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty young. <laughs> I was precocious. <laughs> I'd like to hear the conversation your parents had with you after all that. <laughs> we did have a conversation, and that's why I stopped. <laughs> I do want to commend also all the young people that are here uh, because they have an interest in this, and I would urge them to continue this all through their lives, even when they're no longer young. If you have something of an interest to you, I think you ought to let elected officials know. And uh, if you're so motivated, you ought to consider uh, at some point uh, being part of that process and running for office yourself, and I couldn't urge you more because that's what democracy is all about. Dr. Farley, you had mentioned that 7-Elevens uh, failed 34% of the time. Right. How big was that study? How, what, you know, how many? That's data across, uh, I believe it's two and a half to three years. Uh, and so that uh, would be probably hundreds of uh, attempts. Hundreds? The other, the other question I have, uh, we have 100%, we talked about the, the ID scanners, but it is a way to, um, to do some regulation. Since the 100% scanners uh, went into effect October 31st, how many violations are you aware of that have occurred since that time? October 31st, you mean as in two, two weeks or so ago? Yeah. We don't have any data. I don't have any data since then. Well, how recent is your data? I mean, is it... Is it how, when, when you recite data here, how old or how fresh is it? Um, you know, it, it includes up to 20, uh, certainly through the end of 2018, and I'm not sure about in 2019. Certainly would, would not include data from the last two weeks. Okay. Well, that's, that's a fair answer, but then again, we're going to cite data. I think, it, you know, and, and, and having violations of this nature um, is, uh, is serious. But also these the ID scanners of 100% uh, uh, in, in 7-Elevens, I think that ought to be looked at as well and see how many violations there are since they went to this 100% grouping. So, you know, the, the, the first I've heard about, um, you know, there was a, a claim made before the hearing that there was some sort of new technology that had been in place in the past couple of weeks. I don't understand how that's different from what was there before. I would be interested in knowing more about that. Uh, I can only tell you what we, you know, done uh, our data based on what's been there before. So most of the time, your data that you recite here would be, correct me if I'm wrong, or, you know, six months to a year old, at least, maybe older. Uh, you know, I'll have to get, you, get back to you on exactly how recent it is. That would be, that would be helpful. Be happy to. Uh, Dr. Farney, th thank you very, very much. Madam okay. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, members of the committee. Thank you, Dr. Farley. It's not your first rodeo attempt no. to do something um, that might face preemption by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, as we looked at the flavored tobacco issue in wrap paper, let me just say uh, for my chairwoman, Councilwoman Bass, I applaud your courage uh, in the sense this is, when, this reminds me of liquor by the drink when you stood up for that and faced a lot of criticism for that but understood it was not only a health hazard at 7 a.m., mm -hmm. people lining up to get drinks That's right. and feed their alcoholism mm -hmm. and things like that, that you stood up for that. Mm -hmm. So this, in my mind, is a continuation mm -hmm. 
of those kinds of efforts because we are disproportionately impacted by these negative things. So here's what I got to say about preemption. They didn't preempt bullets in our neighborhoods when our children die disproportionately from gun violence. Yes. They could stand up and preempt that. Mm -hmm. They could help us by preempting the prison, uh, school to prison pipeline mm -hmm. and adding a little more funding to the stream so that they could properly educate our kids, particularly in conflict resolution. I would love preemption of that. Um, when we look at this issue of flavored tobacco and as well as e-cigarettes, it is purposefully marketed to our children. It is, we, we had a hearing right here, we laid on that table, um, Skittles, right next to one of the flavors. Mm -hmm. We did M&Ms, and all of them were so very similar that to the naked eye, if you just grabbed, you might wind up grabbing the tobacco product. Second thing, in the displays in a lot of these corner stores, they are particularly placed right next to our children's candy as to create a psychological attraction to these colors and flavors that they suggest. You ask the question of, did you ever smoke? Well, I'm an ex-smoker, but more than that, I'm second generation. My father died of lung cancer. My last meals with him were through an oxygen mask where he had to time it so he could eat and then go back to breathing. My mother, died of an aneurysm, which a lot of people, you're the doctor in the house, associated with smoking mm -hmm. and the thinning of membranes and things like that. What I remember is on a worst snowstorm two years ago, we go by my mother's house to bring her medicine. My brother calls me up. My mother is going through that episode of that aneurysm. But what was stuck in my memory was a lit cigarette still in the ashtray. Mm -hmm. So what I have to say about preemption is bring it. But we have a responsibility to these young people to try to save them from themselves, yeah. save them from the industry of tobacco, because we're not fooled. Tobacco is big business. Pennsylvania, believe it or not, other than Pittsburgh and uh, Philadelphia, in the T, is an agricultural state. So there are forces that are aligned, whether you talk about the small corner store at a 7-Eleven, or whether you talk about the farmer in York County that wants to benefit from their addictions. So we have a responsibility to stand up and be counted about this stuff. And if we get struck down in court, so be it. Future generations will say we tried at least right. to defend them. So when I heard about this, I had to come in and let you know um, that I'm proud of this, this panel. I'm proud of this committee for doing the right thing first. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Chairman. Thank you. And I, you know, it, the, the story you just mentioned about your mother brings to mind something similar with my mother who passed away from cancer as well and who was a lifelong smoker. And uh, when she was in the hospital, just days from passing away, she had a roommate um, in, in the hospital room with her who lit up a cigarette. And this woman was also critically ill. There was oxygen in the room. And I just was amazed that here are these two older women. One was smoking and um, you know, my mother was, was perfectly fine with it. She thought it was okay. But there was a time when doctors smoked, as I understand mm -hmm. it, um, in hospitals where, you know, it, it, it you know, just boggles my mind that in, in, uh, on airlines, on airplanes, there was a smoking and a non-smoking section. I don't even know how that, how that worked out. I mean, it just sounds crazy now. But smoking was just so accepted and so much of a part of our culture uh, as Americans. And now we know better. And now that we know better, it's really incumbent upon us to do better, particularly when we think about the next generation. So I thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Greenlee? Yeah, just very quickly. I'm glad Councilman Jones came down because he's been a leader on this whole issue, bringing up the, the issue under 
flavored tobacco products. Yes. So I, and it's really mm -hmm. that uh, effort that brought on this issue too. So thank, and I should just mention for the record uh, that while well, I introduced the bill, you, Madam Chair, Councilman Jones and Council President Clark are co-sponsors of the bill. And just as you brought up family members, I always think about my aunt who uh, got me started on the Phillies. While she used to sit there with a rosary watching the Phillies smoking a cigarette. And she used to say, give me my one vice, I don't do anything else wrong. But that one thing wrong killed her at 70 years old. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we all know what this does. Yeah. And we all know, I'm, I think we have moved forward as Councilwoman Bass has said, but we need to keep moving more forward. And this is a forward uh, looking bill and I think it will help these people, these young people sitting in the, in the uh, audience today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, Councilman. Okay, with no other questions from the panel, thank you, uh, Commissioner. And if we could uh, now have come forward uh, to testify on Bill Number 190804, Dr. Michael Madden and Neil Makhuja Mac from Penn Law. And uh, we are gonna ask in the interest of time uh, if you could summarize your testimony to the best of your ability. Okay. Yeah, there's, a, there's another hearing coming up, so we need to move along. But uh, we want to hear your testimony, but if you could uh, summarize, that Thank would you. be fantastic. Sure. Um, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Michael Madden. I'm a family physician. I am currently president of the Board of Allies for Health and Well-Being, Southwest Pennsylvania's largest provider of services uh, for people with HIV, HIV and, to and to prevent it. I also am recently retired as Chief Medical Officer of Gateway Health Plan, which has been a provider of Medicaid, of healthcare services for Medicaid and Medicare recipients in Philadelphia and the rest of Pennsylvania. Um, I am committed to harm reduction in many, many areas, and this is one of them. I will also tell you that I am a paid consultant for the Reynolds Corporation, RAI Services Company. Um, summarizing, um, I guess the, the, the key points that I would like to make is that while this is a good bill, we would encourage you to amend it in uh, two very specific ways. Those are allowing the sale of tobacco and menthol flavored products regardless of nicotine content that do not primarily appeal to youth, and I will give you data about that, and allowing the sale of vapor products that have received pre-market approval from the Food and Drug Administration. The, the voice of the people that have not really been heard here are the current smoke, adult smokers who are looking for ways to help them deal with their addiction. I fully and completely, as does Reynolds, share your concern about youth vaping. No youth should use tobacco products, including vaping products. But these two very modest uh, exceptions to this ordinance will, I think, uh, not impair the activity of avoiding youth uptake of vaping products. Let me first talk to the menthol issue. National data confirms that youth do not use tobacco or menthol vaping flavors. Um, there is a well-known study uh, called Monitoring the Future that tracks this over time. If you have a copy of my printed uh, testimony, you will see a chart on page two that looks at the flavor choices of children. You will note that a very minuscule percentage choose to use menthol, Virginia tobacco, or tobacco flavors. These are reasonable exceptions. These are not flavors that appeal to youth. And we certainly endorse your activities against other flavors uh, and youth. 90% um, of 10th and 85% of 12th graders use mint, mango, fruit, cream, or, or cucumber, but they do not use menthol. It would be illogical to, uh, to prohibit menthol vaping products, but continue to allow menthol tobacco products. And that's what this bill would, ha would allow to happen at retail. Um, the second one is to address real carefully the point of tobacco harm reduction, being sure that we have good availability of these products for current smokers to move from cigarettes. 
there is good evidence that this works. Um, the, the National Academy of Sciences endorses this concept. Public Health England, has, as has pre previously been stated, endorses it. The FDA endorses this as an opportunity to move people from combustible tobacco to a safer product. Not completely safe, but much safer product. I encourage the committee to, uh, to consider that point and consider the needs of current smokers. Um, the other one that I want to address is the, the concern raised about lack of action at the federal level. In fact, there is a good bit of action going on right now at the federal level. The pre-market uh, uh, approval process known as PMTA is alive and real. All current vaping products that are on the market must submit their product for review by the FDA by May of next year, a scant six months away. Reynolds has already submitted that for our product, and despite the comment that there is no evidence to support this, Reynolds has submitted 150,000 pages of testimony, studies, and information to support the safety of this product. What is the FDA looking at? Specifically, to achieve this approval, manufacturers have to provide extensive and persuasive evidence that their products will provide a harm reduction benefit for existing smokers while limiting their appeal to and access by youth, the exact combination of policy you're looking to achieve. Um, so in short, I would ask you to make two minor modifications to this otherwise good bill and allow for menthol to be sold uh, at, at retail where, it is, where they uh, are checking for um, for age of the person and to allow that, that products that are approved by the FDA in this pre-market process continue to be sold at retail. I'll stop there and sorry if that was too rushed, but I tried to uh, meet your request. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and for, um, for, for your um, suggestions. Um, I know that there is an amendment and we'll, we'll certainly consider. Uh, what you have um, suggested. So we'll have some conversation about that. Um, Mr. McKeeja. Mc say again. Uh, my name is Neil McKeeja. McKeeja. Thank okay. You. Thank you very Thank much. You, Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Sure. Uh, my name is Neil McKeeja. I'm a consumer protection lawyer and a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Um, I'm here today because Can I represent the mic closer to you, just a little bit closer. Sure, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm here today because I represented parents and children in one of the first class actions against Juul Labs. There are now over 160 cases pending in federal court. Since then, I've been pursuing academic research on the issue uh, through public records and FOIA requests, and I think it's incredibly important. Uh, to question how we got to this situation and whether or not this legislation can completely address the problem or at least do the most that the Philadelphia City Council is able to within, within your power. So as Commissioner Farley stated, the numbers are simply staggering with this epidemic. In 2017, 1 1.5 million children were vaping. In 2018, it went up to 3.5 million and now in 2019, the estimates are over 5 million uh, kids. That's middle school and high school kids that are now vaping. So this month, the FDA was expected to introduce a federal ban on flavored e-cigarettes. They failed to do so. A recent Politico article said it was because President, President Trump's advisors thought it was going to harm him politically. And it had nothing to do with public health. So at a moment like this, it's incredibly important that the Philadelphia City Council and other legislative bodies throughout the country step up and do what they can to protect the nation's children. So the, in order to understand this, you have to look at Juul. Juul is one of the fastest growing companies in American history. It reached a $10 billion valuation faster than Facebook and in 2018 was valued at $38 billion after Altria, the, the parent company of Philip Morris, invested to buy a third of the company. 
And during that period of time is when we went from 1.5 million kids to more than 5 million. Former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb says that the youth vaping epidemic is almost entirely attributed to Juul and their flavored products. Juul's success came from its chief innovation, which was to make nicotine more potent and palatable for children. If you look at Juul's patent literature, you can see that the product, potentially, at least in this patent, it hits users more quickly and more effectively than regular combustible cigarettes, which would indicate that it's more addictive. In one study, 63% of kids did not even know Juul had nicotine in it, in all flavors. So there are a lot of kids out there who think that they're just inhaling mango vapor. And that's part of the problem. When Juul first went on the market, they didn't even have nicotine warnings. FDA Commissioner David Kessler, who in the 90s took on the tobacco industry, has written that Juul took a page out of Big Tobacco's playbook. For example, in 1972, Brown and Williamson wrote an internal memorandum titled Youth Cigarette, New Concepts, in which they found it was a well-known fact that teenagers like sweet products. The manufacturer of Newport cigarettes also had another memorandum which suggested borrowing consumer data from the company which produces Lifesavers to determine which flavors that kids like most. Juul is on record having stated, the CEO, particularly James Monsies, the former CEO, that they wanted to recreate the magic and luxury of the tobacco industry, which created the cigarette, the most successful consumer product of all time in the eyes of Mr. Monsies. But beyond mere words, big tobacco, as the saying goes, sorry, Jules' imitation of big tobacco was its highest form of flattery, beyond those words. So, Originally, speaking of Reynolds, if you look at where Juul came up with their nicotine salt formulation, it was from tobacco industry documents uh, from R.J. Reynolds from 1979. So the founders of Juul have on record stated that they were digging through the trove of tobacco documents that came out of the master settlement agreement when they came up with the product. One of those documents that came out of an FDA FOIA request and was recently reported, reported in, FOIA, uh, in Reuters was a document from R.J. Reynolds showing um, the efficacy of nicotine salts. So Juul is also so similar to Marlboro, or was so similar, their marketing and branding to Marlboro, that, that Philip Morris actually sued Juul in 2015 for trademark infringement because of how similar their design was. Even the name Juul resembles Cool, the number one menthol cigarette. There's no question that this company was trying to recreate what they said was the magic and luxury of big tobacco, but there's no luxury in smoking. Smoking inflicts addiction. Addiction is the opposite of choice, and it's a disease. What I would like to raise to you and to at least address uh, are the arguments for harm reduction. Now, in Philadelphia, we're one of the first cities in the nation that is that is considering yeah. supervised injection sites, and, and we recognize that harm reduction is, is, a, is an area of policy that we should pursue in, in any um, number of settings. But here's the problem. Those settings are not driven by profit. Juul is driven by profit, and we must be very skeptical of any proponents of harm reduction who are based on the original business model of the tobacco industry, which was addicting children and hooking them for life. So if we're going to talk about harm reduction, it has to be in a different framework. It can't be through supporting industry policies that are pushed by lobbyists. It's I, re I really hate to rush you. Thank you. Because your testimony is, is very good and very important. Um, but I am going to ask you to summarize because we still have uh, a significant list and um, yeah. we have a um, a uh, hearing that we're coming up against. So of we're course. getting ready to run out of time. So. Of course. Yes, but thank you. I think Commissioner continue. Farley did a great job at covering uh, many of the issues related to the regulation. Mm -hmm. The last point that I would make is that the FDA, as, um, as he has mentioned, has not ruled on whether or not these, these products are appropriate for the protection of public health. Mm -hmm. That will happen after May 2020. I don't think it's an overstep 
to, to ban these products the way that San Francisco and other, other states have. Montana has implemented a ban, uh, at least a moratorium. Massachusetts has done so. Uh, this very much to me does feel like a compromise bill and it's not an overstepping any boundaries. And um, I'll leave it at that and take questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony from both of you. Councilwoman Gim? Um, yes, I just had a couple of quick clarifying questions. Um, so Dr. Madden, could you explain what RAI Services is? It's a subsidiary of the Reynolds Corporation. It, it, you know. RJ Reynolds? Yes. The tobacco company? Correct. Um, that has subsidiaries for Newport Camel, American Snuff, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, the particular product that, of interest today is called Views. Okay, so you are a doctor representing R.J. Reynolds here yes, in City Council. because based on my independent research mm -hmm. of the literature related to tobacco harm reduction mm -hmm. and the fact that my mother died of tobacco-related illnesses, and that my lifelong career has so, been supporting people in lower socioeconomic mm -hmm, groups, you. I believe we should offer harm reduction strategies for people mm -hmm. who have the difficult thank task you. of moving from Understood. combustible tobacco. Are cigarette e-cigs and vaping considered medical devices? Are e-cigs con considered medical they are devices? They're not currently classed that way by the FDA, but probably will after the PMTA process. Okay, they are not considered medical devices. They are not. Okay, thank you. Um, so they are not the same as nicotine patches. They would not be prescribed by a doctor or any other well, they don't require medical professional. They don't require a prescription, but physicians that counsel patients dealing with addictions know <coughs> that harm reduction is an, is an alternative. A number of national medical bodies have supported the concept that if people are not able to quit, either on their own or with traditional nicotine replacement right. products, that tobacco harm reduction is a reasonable strategy for those people to try mm -hmm. as, as a safer alternative to combustible I tobacco. I understand. And that is your testimony on behalf of R.J. Reynolds, a tobacco company. As You're at, yes, that okay. is true. All right. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Okay, no additional questions from the panel. Thank you very much for being here and for Thank your you. very important testimony. Um, we have one final, pa <coughs> excuse me, one final panel to bring forward. Ms. Diazia Wilson from the Advocacy, Advocacy Institute. She's with the Real Talk Tobacco Program. Thank you for being here. Also, uh, Nancy Kurtz from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Dr. Brian Jensen from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Jeff Allen from PFMA. If you could come forward. And if you want to, Ms. Um, Wilson, if you want to state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Um, my name is Deasia Wilson. Bring, bring the microphone closer, please. My name is. Deasia Wilson. Um, hello, everybody. I would first like to thank Chairwoman Bass and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. My name is Deasia Wilson, and I am 17 years old. And I am part of the Advocacy Institute's Real Talk Tobacco Program. I am currently in the 12th grade, and over my years in high school, I have seen such a difference in the kids that vape. When I first started off as a freshman, I had never even heard of a vape pen. Now students are comfortable enough to pull out their jewel as soon as teachers turn their heads. I can remember walking into the bathroom in the beginning of my first period, and I would have thought there was a party going on or something. There was a fruity fog filling the air while girls sat on the floor gossiping and trading jewels. There were so many people in the bathroom, I couldn't even get to a stall. All the hanging out in the bathrooms has caused people to struggle academically. For example, my friend goes to the bathroom literally every period to vape. And when I asked her why, she said, it's not that easy for me to just stop. She is 16 and addicted to something she thought was harmless. Not only that, but she has failed almost every class in her first marking period. Some schools think that locking the bathrooms would be the best thing to get students back on track. But what, what about the kids that simply just have to use the bathroom? There was one time I had to use the bathroom to change my tampon, and I couldn't even get in because my school doesn't want kids to go in and vape. I felt so embarrassed to have to go back into class and say that I needed to go to the nurse because of my period. I think that stopping stores from selling flavored e-cigarettes and vape juice will make a huge difference in the youth that use these products. To me, it seems like most kids buy a bunch of flavors to see which one they like best. 
And even if they don't like a flavor, they will use it until it's gone because they don't want to waste their money. If vape juices and e-cigarettes didn't have so many flavors like candy canes, strawberry rolls, sour worms, birthday cake, and fruity pebbles, or even pretty colors that stand out to the youth, I feel like there wouldn't be many youth tempted to use these products. Nobody wants to smoke a tobacco-flavored vape because it takes the curiosity out of vaping. Everybody knows that cigarettes or tobacco is bad for you. The word vape is an allusion to the harm that comes from using the products. And all the different flavors put the icing on the cake. One jewel pod has just, just as much nicotine as a full box of cigarettes. This target to the youth is a deadly addiction. And people like my friend are struggling to get help. You are in the position to do something about this in our city. Will you work to protect the youth in Philadelphia from vaping? Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Kurtz, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. My name is Nancy Kurtz. I am the assistant superintendent for the Archdiocesan High Schools. As educators, our role is to attend to the whole child. We concern ourselves with a person's intellectual, social, and physical development. We understand the deep connection among the three. The programming and curriculum in both elementary and secondary schools helps students not only develop their intellectual skills, it helps them develop a deep appreciation for their body, mind, and spirit. At one time, the use of cigarettes by students in schools throughout the archdiocese was a persistent problem which impacted the health and well-being of our students and required the allocation of time and financial resources to address its impact. The problem was all but eradicated in our schools due to a combined effort that included education, outreach, community support, and legislation. In the past couple of years, instances of student vaping in schools across the archdiocese have grown exponentially. We, at the Office of Catholic Education, first became aware of this issue in March of 2018, when students were caught in a school vaping in a bathroom. It quickly became apparent that this was not a one student, one school problem. Although the prevalence of these products varies throughout the archdiocese, there is not one school whose students are not impacted in some way. We once again find ourselves faced with a nicotine crisis in our schools that in many ways is more insidious than that we overcame previously with cigarette use. The design and concealability of the e-cigarette makes them difficult to detect. Packaging is not as clearly labeled. Flavors used in pods are highly appealing to young people. The sweet candy-like flavors confuse parents and students about what is actually in the pods they are buying. Students and parents are often unaware of the presence of nicotine or of the true amount of nicotine present in the pods being used. Students have reported becoming addicted to vaping without awareness that they are even consuming an addictive substance. One such student attends our high schools. He spent almost two weeks in the pediatric intensive care unit at AI, AI DuPont Hospital for children. He was diagnosed with pneumonitis, which his doctors attributed to his regular use of a vape for over a year. This healthy, athletic teenager believed that the products he used, mainly fruit-flavored, were not harmful, and his life was forever changed because of it. Once again, key school resources are being diverted to combat this issue, which is directly impacting the health and well-being of our students. Schools are engaging in programs from Cora and Karen to offer cessation programs and other support for students who are already engaging in e-cigarette use. Programs through the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and other entities are being instituted by leaders from the Office of Catholic Education to local school principals to educate parents, students, and other stakeholder groups on the dangers of the use of e-cigarettes by children and teenagers. Time resources are being dedicated in schools to monitor student behavior 
in an effort to prevent the use of e-cigarettes on campuses. Our efforts alone will not be enough to stem the tide of this persistent problem of teen vaping. This issue requires us to once again come together as educators, community leaders, and lawmakers to protect the students of the city of Philadelphia. Thank you for your testimony. And please state your name. So hi, I'm Dr. Brian Jensen. I'm yes. a practicing primary care pediatrician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'm also a researcher based at University of Pennsylvania. I'm also a tobacco treatment expert, and I don't work for a tobacco company. So I'm here. We've had great testimony from my colleagues hearing what's happening in the school settings. Let me kind of talk about what we're seeing in the office, in the clinical, in the patient experience setting. And I'll be brief. A lot of people have already hit up the, the, the key points here. So I'm here today in my official capacity as a doctor to offer my expert insight as someone who takes care of children, adolescents, and young adults in our city. So this group can have the best evidence available to them on this critical health issue, the epidemic of adolescent vaping and e-cigarette use. Children, as we all know, are a vulnerable population, and my job as a pediatrician is to protect them from harm and dangerous products. E-cigarettes are clearly dangerous. Their use puts children and teenagers at risk for significant harm and a lifelong struggle with nicotine addiction. As a pediatrician who works to keep kids healthy and safe, I find the details of e-cigarette use incredibly disturbing. I see patients who are so addicted to these products that they can't pay attention in school. Further, this addiction is limiting their ability to participate in sports and concentrate on other activities. This addiction causes dramatic changes in teenagers' moods, impacting their relationships with their family and friends. Almost daily, I receive questions from parents, teachers, school nurses, pediatricians, and patients about how can we best help teens that are addicted to nicotine and help protect teens from these essentially unregulated products. So we've talked on some of these points before. Originally marketed to help adults quit smoking, a claim with actual little evidence to back it up, e-cigarettes have been particularly appealing to youth because of their discreet designs and sweet and fruity flavors. In fact, almost all youth who vape use flavored e-cigarettes. And here's an important point. And while more than 25% of high school students regularly use e-cigarettes, fewer than 5% of adults actually use these products. This is a teenage use issue. Teen patients often tell me they're only vaping flavors, not realizing that they're being misled as to actually what is in the products. In reality, e-cigarette solutions contain numerous harmful toxicants and cancer-causing chemicals, just like traditional cigarettes. Also, the nicotine concentration in some products is incredibly high, with many vape pods containing the same amount of nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes, as we've already heard from. More importantly, the teenage patient that I see in my practice, they're telling me they're using multiple pods a day. They're coming into the office with signs of acute nicotine toxicity, shaking their hands. All this nicotine exposure by teens rewires their developing brain, increasing the risk of addiction to other nicotine products. That's why so many studies keep finding the same results. Adolescents and young adults who use e-cigarettes are at four times increased risk of becoming traditional cigarette smokers. Thus, e-cigarette use makes it easier for teenagers to develop a lifelong addiction that we know kills half its long-term users. Yet even in the face of a growing epidemic, these products lack the regulation needed to adequately protect children and teens. Currently, U.S. federal laws and regulations do not restrict the advertising of e-cigarettes to consumers, nor do they address the need for the safety testing of these products. Without a ban on all flavored e-cigarettes, flavors that we know lead to youth experimentation and addiction are available and marketed to youth. In the absence of strong and effective federal regulation, local action is needed. We must take action now to protect the gains we have made in reducing youth nicotine use, and coordination is the key to our success. In the 1970s, 80s, potentially up to 40% of high school students were regularly using cigarettes. We're down to fewer than 10%, but we've seen a dramatic rise in e-cigarette use during my time in clinical practice over the last 15 years. With the recent legislation introduced by City Council, we have the opportunity to take action to ban flavors in cigarettes and restrict sales of high nicotine products in Philadelphia. We need more research to help teen e-cigarette users quit, but preventing youth use in the first place should be our primary goal. Prevention works. The country's leading medical health advocacy groups, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, of which I'm a member, to the American Cancer Society, all agree that flavored e-cigarette and tobacco products are made for the purpose of attracting kids and fueling the addiction of a new generation of lifelong nicotine users. We can no longer afford to wait as children and adolescents pay the ultimate price. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions after. Thank you all for your testimony. And we have one last speaker, which would be Jeff Allen from PFMA. And is there anyone else here to testify? Nope. Okay. 
Please state Thank your name you, for the uh, record. And oh, I'm Jeff Allen. I'm from uh, the Pennsylvania Food Merchants Association, uh, as well as I'm the owner of Allen Brothers Wholesale in Philadelphia. Um, PFMA represents thousands of members across Pennsylvania and Philadelphia County, including grocery and convenience stores, supermarkets, consumer packaged goods. Uh, we have 800 retail members. We represent 3,500 retail stores, and we supply 200,000 jobs in within the city and the state, obviously. Um, I am a business owner. I employ about 90 people. Since 1910, my company's been in Philadelphia, um, which is about 119 years. And I'm certainly not here to advocate teen use of vape products or tobacco products. I'm personally a proponent of 21 for tobacco, which the state I know is currently looking at and the federal government's looking at. Um, I do know that from my own experience and, and being in this industry, which, isn't, which sells a lot of other products, we sell 6,700 different types of products to the stores in Philadelphia. Um, grocery products, frozen food products, soda products, although not as much as we used to. That goes across the border. Um, that's a black market in Philadelphia now. Um, as well as a lot of cigarette products that are a black market because of the taxes that we imposed about five years ago. So uh, I'm, I'm merely here to say that I do support my community. I believe in legal products. Um, certainly tobacco is not a, a product that we want teens to use or vape. And I can't take personal responsibility for how the vape industry marketed these products or, or got these products out there. Um, I don't 100% disagree with the health commissioner's uh, bill to stop teen use of the product. But what we do is we constantly put a Band-Aid on trying to solve a pro problem by, by uh, banning it, by taxing it. And quite honestly, what happens, and I see it because I service two other states besides Pennsylvania. I service Delaware and New Jersey. In higher tax states, whether the product's tobacco, whether it's grocery products, certainly with sugar-sweetened beverage products, we watch the sales go down in Philadelphia County, um, which hurts Philadelphia County for taxes, hurts Philadelphia County for jobs, um, puts the state on the hook, I know, for Philadelphia County to come up with more money to, to help the city. Uh, I'm in the 25th district in Philadelphia County. Um, do a lot of work with the police in the 25th district. Do a lot of fundraisers for them. Um, we just did their Halloween party at Lighthouse, Lighthouse Field gave out tons of candy to the kids in the community. Uh, we also do their carnival, which is done, which has gotten big, um, which is done in the largest heroin, you know, drug part of the city. Um, and I commend them on the work they do. But what I also see in Philadelphia is blocks and blocks of neighborhoods that have no stores left because they have no products to sell. Everything's regulated. Um, and I guess what gets me is I know the products are being bought in other counties or shipped to other counties or brought into other states. And uh, I think that all we're proposing here today, and I don't want to take up too much more time because you guys have been very patient. Um, we believe in 21 for this vape product. We don't want it in the hands of children. Um, we've, we've made an a, a amendment to have the product be a scannable product. And I get that there's been a lot of talk about the retail community and it, it, listen, these people, these stores, these supermarkets, these bodegas, these uh, uh, convenience stores, gas and goes, I mean, they supply products that people buy and they have a right to supply them properly, you know, and the city or the state has the right and the federal government has the right to police them if they don't do the job properly. I mean, I can't defend a retail store that sells a product to an underage user. I mean, I think it's crazy. I don't understand it. But I also think the city should allow that to happen or the state should allow that to happen. So we've put in an amendment um, that doesn't call for a ban. Flavors, get rid of them. I mean, mango, cherry, banana, whatever it is. Uh, tobacco and menthol are products that adults use. We can all say that they don't. And I can listen to doctors and lawyers state facts. Uh, I don't agree with all those 
it's facts. I've been in this, this consumer goods business for a long, long time, so I've heard a lot of things thrown out that, that I, I, I know aren't true. So a lot, of, a lot of adults use menthol products and tobacco products. And quite honestly, if a, an adult is a vapor, you know, and he's getting off of combustible cigarettes, I used combustible cigarettes 15 years ago, and I quit. Um, I use vape products personally, um, and, and I hate to say this, but I think the type of person I am, I probably would be smoking combustible cigarettes if I didn't have vape products. Whatever that's worth, that's my, my personal opinion. And that's not about me wanting to sell a vape product to a teen, because I certainly don't. Nor do I want a teen to smoke marijuana or shoot dope and wind up at, you know, second in Somerset. Because what I see in Philadelphia, and I live in Philadelphia, I lived here for 14 years, I moved to the suburbs, I moved back. I love the city of Philadelphia. It's been good to my family. I retired hundreds of families. To our pub we're going into a public meeting of motions and we're going to start with bill number 190715 I want to recognize Councilmember Greenlee for a motion thank you madam chair I I let me finish Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I the chair recognizes Councilmember Greenlee for a motion on bill number 190715 Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to Bill Number 190715 be reported as committee with favorable recommendation. The rules of council be suspended. Allow for first reading. Next session of council. Second. The bill has been moved and properly seconded that Bill Number 190715 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All in favor will uh, of this motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay? The ayes have it and the motion carries and bill number 190-715 will be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation with a request that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at the next session of council. Chair now recognizes. Okay. Chair now recognizes Councilmember Greenlee for a motion. Chair recognizes Councilmember Greenlee for a motion on for uh, a motion on the amendment to Bill Number One Nine Zero Seven Eight Eight. Uh, to, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Together with the sponsor, I, I'm, I'm uh, presenting an amendment to Bill Number One Nine Zero Seven Eight Eight. Uh, the amendment has been circulated to members of the committee, and I move the adoption of the amendment. Second, it has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to Bill Number One Nine Zero Seven Eight Eight be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Okay, the ayes have it and the motion carries. And the amendment to bill number 190788 has been approved. I now want to recognize Councilmember Greenlee for a motion on bill number 190788 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that bill number 190788 as amended be reported as committee with favorable recommendation and the rules of council be suspended to allow for first reading on that session of council. Second. Okay, it's been moved and properly seconded that bill number 190788 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and fur further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Okay. The ayes have it and the motion carries and bill number 190788 as amended will be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation with a request that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at the next session of council. Okay, uh, I want to recognize Councilmember Blondo Reynolds Brown, who has a motion on Bill Number One Nine Zero Eight Zero Four. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, given the, the testimony presented by all, I wish to offer amendments that have been circulated to members of the committee to Bill Number One Nine Zero Eight Zero Four. Can I speak? The motion has been uh, uh, been given and seconded. We want it. Uh, Councilman Greenlee would like to be recognized. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I, I appreciate Councilman Reynolds Brown um, uh, offering an amendment to try to find a uh, compromise here. As I said earlier, I believe this bill, as it states, is a compromise. I think the best um, solution to this problem, and it is a serious problem, is to keep kids away from this product and keep the product away from the kids. And um, I think this bill has been well thought out, and I think it should remain in its present form. And would all, uh, so I respectfully would ask that this, um, uh, the amendment that was offered be declined. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Okay, so the bill has been, um, or the, the amendment has been offered and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Nay. Okay, the motion has um, not been approved. Uh, and so I want to recognize Councilman Greenlee for a motion on the bill um, as presented 190804. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that bill number 190804 be reported out as committee with a favorable recommendation and the rules of council be suspended to allow for first reading our next session of council. Second. Okay, the, it's been moved and properly seconded that bill number 190804 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. Bill number 190804 will be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation with a request that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at the next session of council. That concludes the business of this committee on public health and human services for today. I thank you all very much for your attendance and patience. Thank you. Okay.